Good evening, everyone. Welcome tonight to tonight's meeting of the Montpelier City Council. Um, so first item is to review and approve the agenda. And we have had a, a lot of comments on the sprinkle ordinance. That's our last substantive item tonight. We have a very long and full agenda. And I'm going to suggest that we put that off to our next meeting. There are some members of the Planning Commission who wanted to comment on it who aren't going to be able to be here. Uh, I think there's some question about you know, when we're going to get to it. And um, so I, I would really ask that we not put it off. And the reason for that, I, we will have a second reading and we'll have ability for folks to talk about. Um, but we're talking about things that are going to affect the building season this year. And we have folks currently who have requested variances that the variance committee is unable to give out under the current ordinance. And so it is urgent for people's projects this year. Um, I'm happy to move it up, um, but I think it is really important that we at least have the first reading tonight, even if it means that we have a more substantial discussion at the next meeting. Okay, other thoughts? I would agree with that. Okay. All right, uh, so we, will, we, we do have a whole host of budget things that we need to get through first. At least I, you know, I would argue we need to do those first and then we could we have, um, let's see, three items, the farmer's market, dog ordinance, and sprinkle ordinance. So we could just reverse those if folks want to do that and put the sprinkle ordinance as item number 14. Does that work? Okay. So that's what we'll do, and we'll get to it when we get to it. I also just need to add um, onto the liquor license thing. We got uh, the renewal from Belladonna across the street. So. Any other changes to the agenda? We're supposed to move up the. Um, Thank you. There's an addendum. Thank you, and I don't have. Let's see if I can call that up. Oh, I thought it's not on the consent agenda. I thought it was just a add-on. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. I'm just trying to find it. Here. It came from Jamie today. Yeah. Anybody beats me to it? Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is this item that uh, has been proposed is the proclamation designated fe designating February 11th, 2018, as Amanda Pelkey Day in Montpelier. Amanda is a local Montpelier uh, hockey star. She's going to be competing in the Olympics, and uh, it's a resolution to honor her. So I'm not sure what was being suggested here. It's just it's it was just saying it was we added it to the agenda. No, we, I think we thought people would want to talk about it. So, okay, great. Um, and just suggested move it to the beginning so people. Well, I can say I'm very proud of Amanda, and it was her fourth grade, or uh, four, I think when she was four years old, was her, uh, was her little league coach. So <laughs> that started then. <laughs> so very exciting to see her uh, success. Uh, any other comments? Or, okay, and I think we're going to maybe do something else, as yeah. I understand it, outside uh, another event that involves more people in the community. Okay, so we'll add, add that uh, uh, proclamation as part of our consent agenda when we get to that. Um, we do need to approve the agenda, though. With that change, uh, without any objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Next item is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for anyone to comment on anything that's not on our agenda. Okay, so if we get something, yeah, Ben. I'm Ben Eastwood. Um, I live on 241 Main Street. Um, so I'm concerned with the lack of transparency around the event at the high school the other day. Um, as a parent of a student who was there at the high school, I first want to say a thank you to all the teachers and staff at the high school for doing an amazing job under a horrifying circumstance. But as a citizen, um, I'm concerned whenever there is a, a lack of transparency um, in an investigation. And um, I'm just curious as to 
what the mechanism for public oversight for the police department is peculiar. <coughs> because I looked on the website, and unlike many communities, there is no public oversight board. There is no mechanism for the public to have an input into how our police department polices in our city. There is no public record of what the um, requirements for the use of deadly force are. So um, I just want to sort of, I know this is a, a tough, a very tough subject for a lot of us, um, you know, but I think that Mrs. Giffen deserves a full, transparent, honest uh, accounting for what happened. And as a community, we deserve that as well. I just want to leave that there. I don't have okay. a particular question. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Thank, uh, thank you for your comments. Responding. Just briefly, Bannon, for anyone who's listening, um, the matter is under investigation by state police, not the city, uh, and that's typical because, uh, well, first of all, they were heavily involved in the incident. Second of all, um, when something does occur with one, you want a different agency looking at it. That's also reviewed by the elected attorney general and the elected state's attorney. Uh, the city council, through me, over is the citizen oversight for the the police department itself, I think any policies they have, whether it's about deadly force, would be certainly our public record, we have to share those. Um, in this case, any time we've received any information at all from the state police, we've immediately published it. We, uh, you know, I don't know any more necessarily than, than you do. We expect and are told we're going to have a full complete accounting with video and other records and of the account when it's ready and uh, hopefully soon. We all want the same thing. And I agree with you that the family and the community and the officers involved all deserve to have the full story out. And, and I'm not looking to armchair quarterback what happened there, but I'm also just concerned going forward as a community, you know, this brings up this issue that we don't really have a public mechanism to discuss or to even really be aware of what the policies are that, 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 that the police are operating under within our city. And that's the discussion that I would like to see started, is to, you know, a lot of cities have a, um, a, a citizen review board that can oversee, that can uh, suggest policies for the police, that can uh, investigate if there's, you know, com citizen complaints um, about alleged misconduct. And I think that the public is best served, the more transparent our law enforcement is. You know, who, as the you know, saying, who watches the watchers? <laughs> and. Um, it, it was just, and when this happened, and you know, I found out via text from my son who was in lockdown, and I have to say, I, again, thank you to the school um, for their quick release of information, and to you, or, or John, or whoever, um, you know, updated the city uh, web, web page quickly. Um, you know, in this modern day of uh, immediate social media communication, um, you know, it is really good to, you know, every, every minute that I didn't have information from the school was an eternity, and I think a lot of parents felt the same way. So, thank you. Well, I had a parent, I had a child at that school too, so right. I know exactly how you feel. <coughs> thank you, Ben. Okay, any other comments? All right, next item is the consent agenda. Do you have a motion to approve that? So moved. Second. Uh, discussion, just. Um, I'd like to pull B and C, please. Uh, B and C, <coughs> did you say? Okay. okay. So we will come back to those. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so we move to item five, Green Mountain Transit, bu Transit Budget Proposal. Good evening. Mayor, City Council members, thank you for having me here this evening. I know we tried one other night and it just went a little bit too long, so, um, so I appreciate you letting us get back in here and, and have a conversation. A um, couple things. My name is Mark Sousa. Uh, I'm the general manager uh, of Green Mountain Transit um, and have been for about a year, but has, have been with GMT for uh, a little over three years. Um, one of the um, a couple of things I want to kind of mention before I kind of get into some of maybe the recommendations and options that the city might want to think about. Uh, currently, we are in the process of doing a, a next-gen um, 
comprehensive service analysis of our service. We've never done that in the years. That we've always added service, but we've never quite been able to bring in a third party to kind of look at the five counties that we're in and kind of look at how they all work together. We're also doing a fair structure. All of that is on our web page, and what, what they're doing is they're doing uh, route profiles. Um, and I will say that this, this route has come up as a possibility of, of having some changes made anyway, so th that was kind of in the works. Um, so that is, is all on our web page called NextGen, and that will kind of give you kind of the recommendation. That they'll come in with a final recommendation to our board, and then we'll have to make some, some decisions on, on what, what those look like. Um, it's everything from um, even down here where we currently have um, deviated routes, uh, which means we go off track to go pick up people, um, to possibly having a uh, complimentary paratransit um, service, which is three quarters of a mile from the fixed route, which would also help with what we're talking about this evening. So that's just another kind of another caveat that's kind of in this in this uh, in the works right now. Um, so we came up with s several options. Um, the the forty thousand dollars that we that we're talking about here is represents twenty percent of the 200000 that we that, that this route um, currently costs. Um, so we have a, a couple options that we could we could talk about. And I understand you have to make decisions tonight. So I was saying to Bill, I could put it in a memo, but it appears tonight they, you have to have decisions. So I'll kind of go right. through them um, with you, and then um, I, I can answer any questions you might have. Um, so one of the options is, if anybody knows how that circulator runs, it's, it runs in two loops. Um, and so. One of the recommendations is we, uh, another, let me step back just a little bit. Uh, the capital shuttle is now year round, um, thanks to BGS who has come in and wanted the capital shuttle to be year round. So what happens with this circulator is it's doing some double, double service. And so we think, in our opinion, and I'll give you the option that we think you might want to um, consider, um, is that we would, we would kind of work together with those two routes and kind of make it more efficient. Um, but I'll give you some some options, um, and please stop me if if because it's it's if unless you know how to read our bus map and guide, it can be very a little confusing um, with loop one and loop two on the circulator. So, um, so option one would keep the route um, and funding as is, which we know is a little bit of an un. It, it, it's it it has an average of about 71 people a day um, right now as is. And so, you know, our feeling is that with the next gen study coming in, and with the um, capital shuttle doing what it's doing every day, uh, we could go in and probably uh, make it more efficient and um, more time. So, so the option would be more frequency. So, um, option two would be t to eliminate uh, loop uh, loop two, uh, which most of the route is served now by the capital shuttle. Um, the problem with that is um, it's circuitous, uh, long travel lines, uh, Loop 1 would remain and we would eliminate service to Loop 2, which is Freedom Drive. And that, so that there's, we, have, we do have people that pick up on Freedom Drive. So that would be, you know, an, an option, but it also be, you know, could affect some, some, some uh, residents down there. Um, option th kind of option 3 is the one that we kind of think would make a lot of sense. Um, it would be basically... Eliminate loop two and streamline loop one so that it can run in a 30 minute to increase frequency and reduce travel times. The only con to this would be that we would eliminate some of the lower ridership, and that's going to be a recommendation on our next gen, anyways, is some of the lower ridership that, that really doesn't make sense. That um, we would probably have to, I mean, to do any of this, we'd have to have public hearings, et cetera. But um, that would make a lot more sense because then we would kind of merge the capital shuttle and this option three, which would give you more service basically on, on, on the circulator. So that would be our recommendation. Could you say that again? Yes. So what, what's your recommended option? So the recommended option would be to keep the funding as is. We would basically run the service every 30 minutes instead of every 60. Uh, we'd give you more frequency, and we would just we would eliminate low ridership areas. Uh, but as I said earlier, the paratransit piece of what we're going to be recommending with the next gen could pick up some of those residents that would qualify for paratransit, which would be three quarters of a mile from the fixed route. So you would change the routes? Is we that would, what you're? Correct. We would eliminate some. We would eliminate some of the lower ridership areas. We make it 
a, a quicker route, so it would be like a 30 minute, and basically it would be more frequency f for, for the city and the residents. And, and all three of these options cost the same. Correct. I could give you I could give you one option, and I know you're probably going to want to want to know, and and, and that that's, that's fine. Um, it would be the option four, which would eliminate loop two, reduce uh, loop one. Um, the trips would only operate seven in the morning to nine in the morning, and then three thirty to five thirty. So you would miss your midday. So you're basically doing five trips in the morning, five trips in the evening. That would reduce the forty thousand dollars to approximately twenty thousand, but it would also eliminate your midday service. So that, that would be a, a, another option, and that would be a reduction in what you were, I think you were asking. Huh, sure. So I'm wondering um, about, I know that that route is free, um, and right. I'm wondering if um, we've, you've explored um, what the budget would look like if it wasn't free and if there was, I, I think for other routes there are income sensitivities for, you know, you can, if you qualify for um, various benefits, you can qualify for reduced price or free passes um, yeah so the fares really don't impact too much because they're you know fairly minimal okay. um, they're you know a dollar a route if, if we did charge or or uh, 60 cents half you know so they really don't impact the budget too much because it's just not enough revenue uh, because it costs you know two hundred thousand dollars to run the route right. okay. but to answer your question for, yes we are looking at all of that okay Gee. Um, I I wonder uh, in your next gen exploration, if you're looking at barriers to, to ridership, why is the ridership, is the ridership um, plateaued? Or um, is it still increasing? Or no, decreasing? No, our ridership is, is pretty much has, has, is level, but, but has decreased, over, and I'm talking system wide. So it goes, it's been between 6 and 10% ridership has gone down throughout the system. And we feel that, and we've done our research on that, and, and uh, we've, we have about 30 peer agencies that we um, work with throughout the country, and we basically did a survey from all of them. All of them, but two uh, were down in ridership between that 6% and 10%, so this is nationwide. And the two that were up were, had just um, had a brand new transit center that had just come into play, and so the ridership went up because the amenities, you know, made sense. And the other one had to do with, um, I believe, had to do with the way that they did their route changes, similar to what we're doing. So, so the two out of the thirty have had an increase. So, is it? Are, are you thinking that when you you suggest option three, that the um, increasing the route time to thirty minutes instead of sixty minutes, do you see that as enhancing ridership? Is that one of the barriers? Uh, we uh, we believe so. Yeah. This is these routes are very, are very long. And there are some times when we've had people say, well, I can walk to there if I don't have to go all the way out and come back. So we've heard those comments. And these, are, these routes have been in play for, I want to say, eight years maybe. I think that my planning department said eight years. Um, and so things have changed. So now it's really a good time to really take a look at it and, and try to get, build a frequency. In any transit agency, it's, it's you know, efficiency and um, it's on time. And that's, that's a big thing. And it's frequency. I just have one more question. I, I wonder if you ha, have you any kind of mechanism to survey the general public, um, folks who maybe aren't in your ridership, and to ask why aren't you and and so on. Yeah. So we've done. So during the next gen, during this whole process, we've had nothing. We've had a number of um, public hearings surveys online um, we've had people go on we've had uh, literally sit on the bus and then people that were at certain other meetings we would go into those meetings and, and, and like chamber meetings and have conversations and so we have done a lot of that that leg work so it's been in work for about a year so we've been doing that that's that and right now we're in the last phase of outreach which is municipal outreach so we're gonna meet with all the municipalities and talk to their staff and get some feedback from them as well so that's where we are. So we have done a, 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 a lot of, of outreach and surveys and conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, one of the things for me, the circulator wasn't made to be a fixed route stop. It wasn't made to have that density. It was made to get into neighborhoburhoods that I get calls from, whether that's out on Elm Street, uh, Heaton Woods, 
uh, Freedom Drive, which is not in my district, but I hear from people, Terra Street. So if you are making these changes just to get more ridership versus getting to people who are off the fixed route but need it, what's the impact there? Well, the, that will be, I don't think we're trying to gain um, ridership. I think free, you know, the frequency issue for us is, is a big deal. Um, but I do think that some of the fallback could fall back on the, the, the paratransit um, piece that we're working on. Right now we do deviated fixed routes, so mm -hmm. we could do five stops outside the route and come back in. And so those, those people who are on that bus have to wait for the five stops before they get to their destination. Mm -hmm. So what we're kind of focusing on is a true fixed route in this area and then a, a complementary paratransit, which is mandated by the, by the federal government. So right, some of the people right. that we don't serve or that we may end up stay coming out of those neighborhoods could be eligible for that for that um, that service as well. So we have to kind of kind of work on that. You know, it has to work together. Well, just the yeah, one more in. Just yeah. the in, like with your numbers, I know that the mayor made a comment that ten dollars a ride, he wouldn't take his car out of the, his driveway. But the fact of it is, for this kind of demand response deviated route, I went on to the 2016 transit facts put out. And definitely ten dollars per per uh, ride ridership is is average is actually good. Some go as high as fifteen twenty two, especially when you get into smaller transit areas. So I think it's hard to take this route if you're going to get out to the places where people need the ride but don't have the density and compare it to a fixed route like the one between Barry and Montpelier. So I would just like people to be more open to working with you and using the data you have and making some changes, but not trying to decide those changes tonight. But I still feel very committed to this $40,000 for transit, and we can modify how to use it, but I feel we really need to keep that commitment. Yeah, and I, I guess, and I, if I, I, I don't really need, we'll work with this route. We, I'm just, I was just giving some, some options, yeah. And, and, and if, you know, if we, if we come back and, and then, you know, kind of the 40000 is still the same, then what we'd do is work with staff here and, and, and our staff to kind of figure out what's the best option. These are, the, the, we tried to combine the two capital shuttle and, and, and the um, cir circulator, and the time points just wouldn't work. We, we probably worked on this hours just trying to figure out if we could just make them both ki kind of work together. But time points, and, and they just don't work. So um, that's why we came up with these options. Well, likewise, I mean, we've had a request from the school, to try, middle school, uh, to try to reach out to kids across the river, and I think that's another place that's not just numbers, but it's also serving the greater good of the needs. Mm -hmm. Others, uh, I don't know who's next over here. Um, well, so I just uh, <laughs> uh, have a question about the procedure from here because um, uh, we're not. <clears throat> this is not something we're putting on the ballot, is so what? we're potentially putting it in, in the budget. And <coughs> um, but if we don't put it in the budget, if we don't agree to that tonight, right, then we they have we, you. Oh. They'll have to go seek signatures. It, to today's they the don't deadline. Have, they don't have time. So they yeah. wouldn't. We, we could. The other option for them is put it on the ballot. But um, all right. So I, I guess I would make the motion that we uh, fund the uh, GMTA through the city budget at the uh, level that we did last year, um, assuming that they pursue option three of limiting loop two and streamlining loop one. Is there a second? I would, I have an amendment. Well, first let's <laughs> see if we have a second. Uh -oh. uh, okay, the motion dies for lack of a second. Do you have a motion? I would move that we uh, provide the $40,000 in our city budget to fund the GMTA line. I second it. So with that, I, no, I'm puzzled. So we give them the money without any direction oh, as to how oh, it gets oh, spent? Thank you. Thank you. I, well, that's I think point. there are that's committees that do this. There are committees that work with GMTA. There are committees that work with the city who, with who know this way better than I do. I'm not going to sit here and dictate what needs to happen for public transit. I think public transit needs to happen, but I'm not in a position to say what the best option is. I like your remote monitors better. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for the work that you're doing in public transit. I remember my family and I were hit head on by another motorist several years ago and um, was taken to the hospital and uh, 
fortunately everyone was okay, but had a couple cracked ribs. And to get to some of the medical appointments for follow-up after that, I used public transit as our car was totaled. And it really made a big impression on me how valuable this service is uh, for people with limited mobility. Uh, I really couldn't drive at that point. I didn't have a car to drive. And it really made a big impression on me also for uh, people coming to our new homeless shelter or coming to access our meal programs here in Montpelier. Uh, people coming and going from their jobs, people who have cars but may choose to utilize public transit. That's a goal of this council, and it's a huge service. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I have a couple of questions, and just for additional clarity, the $40,000 that has been moved is or is not part of the... It's already part of the budget. It's already included in your 1.9 budget. you don't have to move anything if you just pass the budget. It's already in there. But oh. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, wanted to follow up on a discussion from our last meeting, uh, are you or is GMTA uh, anticipating, and the state recently released a report on the future sort of of autonomous vehicles, and I didn't know if, if as you're planning many years out, if, if you're doing anything at this time to accommodate for that? So I, the, the industry, um, you, you, I don't think you, we would have thought it, it is where it is right now today, um, but I went to the national conference and there were just meetings on strictly autonomous vehicles. So they're already in play. They're already in some transit agencies that have, um, say, large campuses, like uh, hospital campuses. They do shuttles. They basically get you to one location, and that vehicle basically takes you all over and drops people off and then comes back. So it's already in play. So um, it, it's, it's an interesting um, – we have started the discussions, but they haven't gone that far because I think everybody's kind of still – I mean, I wrote, in, I wrote in two of them. I was at the conference. It was pretty cool, actually. So. Um, I think that conversation is going to happen sooner than later, like the electric buses. Mm. We didn't think that was going to happen. If you'd asked me three years ago, I would have said there's no way this technology is going to be here, and here we are going to order four in, in, in March. So, you know, I, I would say the technology is going to creep up on us, and so that is going to be a focus. Yeah, certainly it seems as though some of the existing vehicles are important for people with disabilities, but that there may be a role for a variety of different types of vehicles totally in the future. Agree. Um, also wanted to just get an update on when our bus station might be open so that we can start receiving buses as per our most recent timeline. Are we sort of ballpark of when we will start to see GMTA buses in at, Taylor Street? We're still looking at construction beginning in, Mar in May, excuse me, late May, early June, and so 12 months later, so a year from the spring. Maybe. Sure, great. So yeah, we've had great, we've had great working relationships with the city on that, so... It's terrific to hear. I guess lastly, I would just encourage you to explore the increased frequency in terms of when buses come. I think that for people to add on half an hour, an hour to a 15 or 20 minute trip, it may discourage some people in terms of both ends on getting to and from places. Thank you. Okay, any further? Yeah, Mercy. Um, I just wanted to really compliment you on the next gen process. Um, I periodically ride the bus between uh, Montpelier and Barrie, and I followed that process. And I really appreciate the transparency of everything online, the thoroughness of the reports, how responsive your staff is being to people's individual comments. Um, and I also really appreciate the addition of the Root Shout 2.0 app so that we can track when the buses are. Um, and I've found that all those things have made riding much more pleasant. So I appreciate Thank all you. that work. Yeah. The next gen is kind of our, OK, we haven't done this in how many years. So now this is kind of the, the big deal. So we made sure that you know, transparency is the biggest thing for us. So. Other questions? All right. Um, we have motion seconded. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thanks for your work. Fine. Okay, next item, item six, Montpelier Community Fund Board Grant Recommendations. Good evening. Recommendations for us. Yes. Actually, I think we've already received, so yes. we'll just get a chance to look at those. 
Rosie, did you want to? Um, so I did have a chance to look at those, and I saw your note that you had allocated um, based on a budget of 115500 rather than the 106000 that we had um, initially indicated. Um, I talked to Bill about what our options are here because I didn't feel like we were in a position to cut that, but I also didn't want to um, throw in an additional 9500 kind of at the last minute um, without making a, a studied decision about that. Um, and so it sounds like um, we actually have some time in the awarding of the grants, um, and so we don't make, need to make a decision tonight on who to make the awards to. Um, so I would be inclined to keep us at the 106000 level and um, instruct the board to please come back to us with a recommendation um, in the very near future about um, who needs to be, which grants need to be cut. Uh, to get to that level. That's that's the amount we've got to spend on this this year. Um, and, you know, one option certainly is to cut all the grants by about 8%, but I don't know that that is the best or the fairest, and you all have spent a lot of time um, evaluating all these, so I'd like to leave that decision up to you. Um, but, you know, pass the budget tonight with 106000 and not the increased amount. So I'd love to respond to sure. that, if I may. Um, thank you. So um, since the Montpelier Community Fund Board has um, been founded a number of years ago, the direction from the City Council has always been to um, use our collective wisdom and guidance um, to re review and respond to the applications as we received. And, um, and in fact, last year um, received specific direction to really <coughs> ask for the funds that were deemed necessary to fund the applications that were really critical. So with that direction in mind, we went through our process this year. Um, <clears throat> last year, the request based on the total applications was $119,550. Um, upon reviewing the 37 applications that um, we received this year, um, we found $115,000 worth of applications that we felt really merited support, which is $4,550. Uh, less, a 3.8% decrease from our request last year. Um, so after we went through that process, reviewing the 37 applications, meeting as a board, we um, then had heard um, the $106,000 figure uh, post, post decision making. Um, and so we are here tonight as we, as, as we usually are at this time to make our recommendations to the board and wanted to share with you that we're making our recommendations based on the process that we've been instructed to use in years prior and with the guidance that we've had in years prior. Um, I want to also understand that the uh, $106,000 figure was developed based on um, some rationalization around the Just Basics grant. So uh, we'd love to talk about that specifically if that would help bring some light to the situation as well. Sure. Let me just, before you do that, I do want to just comment on the, the, uh, the your statement, Christine, that this is the way that it's always the fund has been directed. So because I don't, that's not my understanding of uh, and, and what I think my recollection of how we've proceeded with it since we created it. Um, the council has always, in my experience, set a target, a number, a cap uh, that the fund had available to allocate. And I think there was some, so in the early years, there were several years where um, the uh, recommendations came in under that cap. And last year, I think it was last year, maybe it was the year before, there were some members of the council who thought that that cap should actually be an amount that was fully allocated. So maybe the confusion arose around that direction, but I think there was never any been any direction by the council to provide uh, recommendations uh, of any amount that exceeded the uh, the allocation that was given by the council or through the staff. So I just want to, this is unique, the first time in our five years, I think, of this, that we've gotten recommendations that exceed the amount that's been budgeted. When, I just, I, I think that I know the answer, but I don't like to assume things. When. Um, when did you make your decisions about what to recommend for the organization? Um, at the meeting. At the meeting. At the meeting. Yeah, so December, December 13th. 13th. Okay. And when did the council set the dollar amount? The 106, or when did city staff set the 106? Um, it was after our meeting, is 
Oh, after. As we heard about, uh, well, no, we heard about we heard a recommendation right from the we, city. Just as we were about to meet. We right. Had, it was we, literally like the day of we heard a recommendation from city well, manager. If you look, if you look at our, the meeting, the minutes of the meeting, the item number three um, is that we received, and I'll just read it, the, the MCF board received a memo from Todd Provencher dated November 30th, 2017, that the city is taking over Just Basics Feast that, quote, since the Feast Meals program has been absorbed by the Senior Center, it was logical to move the funding source with the program costs, end quote, and therefore the city manager is recommending in his budget presentation that the city council reduce the amount allocated to the Montpelier Community Fund Board from 120 to 106 for fifth. So we went into that meeting just having heard that we only had, we were only supposed to have 106,000 Going into what meeting? In, into the, the meeting for the, uh, the voting the, meeting, making the awards to make the decisions. And when right. did the Your city yeah. know that though? When did the city know that that money was going to be shifted? So we right, uh, we notified them. I'm just trying to find actually the communications that I have it. November uh, 30th was what I when had. the committee got the note. I'm just wondering right, right. when so the that, city staff. Right. So that would have been the week after Thanksgiving. So that's the week we would done, have finished the budget. Um, and so as soon as we finished it and realized that this was a change, we notified them immediately. It just strikes me that that would be the kind of thing that, like, that the city would have known about beforehand since, I mean, that just strikes me that notifying them on a day when everything has sort of been this well, thing, yeah. and then I, I understand why it happened, and I, I wanted you to read that piece into the meeting. Um, it just strikes me that that's something that the city should have been aware of before that and knowing that we were going into this process I, I just don't understand why we're going to hold that against this committee who volunteers their time reviews these applications I mean these applications are from community groups across the area that serve really at risk needy populations for these services and I think we as a city have an obligation to be transparent in what we're doing with this fund and, and why this fund exists and to say on the day of that all of a sudden we're, we're cutting the budget by $14,000 for groups that serve our most vulnerable populations just doesn't really pass the sniff test. To What's me. I mean honestly Ashley it's not cutting the funding there was a chunk of money that was had been funded by the fund that was going to be funded through the general fund so the money that was available had not changed for the uh, assuming that the same applicants were received for the same scope of services uh, the same money was going to be available so there's no funding reduction and I, I did want to just add one other element that I think needs part of this discussion and that are the petitions that we're going to be considering later tonight to add another twenty six thousand dollars in additional spending uh, for uh, services that in the past have been funded through the Montpelier Community Fund so if we add the 115,000 that you're requesting and the 26,000 that will be uh, be going on the ballot that's $141,000 for a scope of services that in the past we when we first created the fund were funded at $100,000 so that's a 41% increase in this item of the budget that is dramatically higher than any as far as I know perhaps any any other element of our budget and without any real decision I mean it just seems to me this I mean I think at one point we made some decision to increase it by some amount but it seems to me this fund has grown in uh, in a fairly dramatic manner without uh, decision within the council as to whether we want to uh, you know this is where we want to put scarce uh, tax dollars so I'm concerned about the growth of it, both in terms of this off petition items, but also this um, confusion that seems to arise about how whether there's a, a, a spending limit within the board and, and what that is. So, um, Justin and then Ann. So historically, the council has always, uh, I agree with the sentiment, to not get involved in making any individual adjustments that we've always trusted that you're doing that and thank you for making these recommendations I think we should continue that process it occurred to me that uh, in previous years when uh, this group has not allocated the full amount that was in the budget there would have been leftover money and I'm curious sort of the uh, and I don't know if we have that number available tonight but it was several thousand dollars in the beginning that were wasn't that had the council had allocated as part of the budget process but that wasn't spent and so I'm just thinking perhaps that leftover money from previous years would help bridge this gap that we find this year. Um, I also, 
think it's important to recognize that uh, the work that you do potentially um, limits or helps avoid the um, ballot workaround that we are seeing in this year's ballot and saw in last year's ballot. And so uh, it seems to me we should either fully fund and maintain uh, this process that there was a lot of work put into and in establishing um, or let people go on the ballot because at this point we're kind of seems to be moving towards doing both, which of course is well within um, residents' rights to petition. Um, but we have now two kind of processes by which they can access funds. There's so much important work being done by these nonprofits. I, I don't think anyone disagrees that um, the scope of, of what is being done in our community with this money is huge. Uh, for me to see um, the amount that we're giving the community fund going down at a time when city budgets continue to go up seems a little backwards to me. In, uh, in the past, I have advocated uh, to increase funding uh, to be distributed uh, so that you can at least come closer to or meet need. Interesting. Um, so if I may. Oh, I'm sorry. Ann had a. I'm sorry. Uh, you so you can go ahead. That's all right, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to respond to a couple of the points that have been brought up to date. One is um, that clearly um, the Montpelier Community Fund Board um, doesn't have control over the nonprofits who are seeking to go on the ballot and ask for funds directly from the city voters. Um, and in fact, we have seen a direct relationship between our efforts to create what we feel like is a greater degree of equity and parity in the grants made to nonprofits um, that we uh, uh, inherited those grant amounts that we historically had inherited from the original ballot um, and our efforts to create some equity and parity among those items which meant for some organizations trying to cut to some degree their grants in order to what we felt more fairly distribute grant funding um, among a wider variety of organizations um, and so our effort to do that um, has most likely directly resulted in at least one organization pursuing the ballot option, which obviously is not um, within our control. We still think we made the right decision. Um, the other piece that I would put out there is that um, the pool of applicants is different every year. So, you know, with every uh, grant funding process, you know, if this is an open process, we have a number of nonprofits who apply to us every year, usually between 35 and 45, and that pool shifts every year. And in fact, there's new nonprofits as new organizations find out about this process or new people come up with creative ideas to serve the city. There are new organizations coming to this process and looking for funding. And so, you know, we have a small amount of money that each year we're trying to stretch further and further and further. Um, and so that is an inherent challenge again with this work. Um, the last piece I would put out there is that perhaps there's been a misunderstanding, and it sounds like there has been between the city council and this body as far as um, a budget cap or a budget line item allocated to this process. But in my time on the community fund board, the process that I have experienced is that we come with recommendations. They're, uh, they've been approved to date. It can be approved or declined. And then our understanding is, is that that figure is then included in the city budget. And if there had in the past been a budget line item for the Montpelier Community Fund Board, we have been operating unaware of that fact. So it's good to, if there is, if that is the process, then we would like to know that and be able to work with those bounds. But our understanding is that that budgeting was happening based on the recommendations that we were bringing forth each time. Well, I just don't think that, I mean, I guess Bill can talk about that more directly, but the, the process has always been that the, that the board's recommendations have come within the, re, the uh, proposed budget recommendation from the city manager. This is the first time that that number has exceeded that, uh, that budget figure. And that the board has always coordinated its work with the recommended budget figure of the city manager. So I think everybody's right here. <laughs> but there's some differences in timing and um, actually texting back and forth here with the finance director and others um, we previously I think you started your processes earlier and so the, the early in our budget process usually around the time we were preparing the city's budget 
this group did come and say we think we need 115, let's say, and the council would say yes, we're going to put that in the budget. So that would become an untouchable budget number for us on staff, and then you'd go through your process. This year, um, we so then we do our budget that first week. This year there was that conversation didn't happen. Your applications weren't due till November 27th, and we do our budget the 27th, 8th, or 28th, 9th, and 30th in, in staff, uh, that right after Thanksgiving. We had a budget cap, so to, to respond to, we weren't trying to penalize the, the committee. We were trying to keep hold the amount of money that went to the same amount of programs as the mayor said. So without knowing what you had for applications, we said, all right, well, we spent this much last year, and some of it was for this feast program. So if we're paying for feast, let's keep the rest whole. And as soon as we completed on the 30th, that's when we you know, the, once our staff knew, trying to meet the council's budget limit, we immediately said, all right. Um, in fact, you were the only group that we released any budget information to, because normally I don't tell anybody what's in the budget until I give it to the city council as a public document. But we wanted to make sure that you had the info as soon as we could get it to you, saying, just so you know, it's 106, not 115. So I think we, we missed that earlier, say, October, early November conversation that we've had in the past. So you're right. You brought the recommendations, the council said it, but it was never as late in the process. So I think that's what's happened, and that's how we got here. But, we, you know, I, I know from our end, we wanted to make sure you knew that there was a number change as soon as we knew, as soon as we knew what we were going to recommend. And, of course, it's up to the council to decide what the final number is. Uh, and yep, and so... Um, uh, thank you all for your, for your work on this. Um, I just want to acknowledge that... Uh, uh, I think I've expressed this in past years that uh, I, I trust this committee and whatever it is that you think is uh, worth awarding, um, I trust that you all have done your due diligence and have you know wanted to know um, in past years if the amount um, you know needed to increase from the year prior. And this is, in my mind, within the range of uh, what we've been allocating in the past, and so it seems appropriate. Uh, to me, it's not it's not that unusual. And in thinking about the the grand scope of the um, the, you know, the economics of it over over time, um, you know, we we just came out of a uh, conversation, gosh, just a few weeks ago about the future of this fund and the uh, inclination that other groups may have to uh, not go through the community fund and to get on the ballot. And I think if we send them back to say, you know, cut 8% or find people who you don't actually think are worthy, then that will send the message to those groups uh, that maybe they shouldn't go through this process and that they will um, sort of uh, abandon it and go back to the, the generous voters of Montpelier. Um, and so, you know, I, I guess if, even if the goal is to keep costs down in the long run, even if I'm not well. Anyway, even if that were the goal, right? Then, then I think it's probably wisest for us to um, honor the request of 115. So, Rosie. I'm feeling really uncomfortable because I don't have a good sense of where we're at with the budget right now. We had kind of set a cap, and there's you know a range around there where I'm comfortable. And if we're still in that range, then fine. But I feel like we're creeping out of it. And so I don't know if Bill can. We're at about 2.3 percent right now, with it with all in with ballot items, and including this full request or no. not. So no. this full request probably doesn't affect that. 2.4 percent. Okay. No, I mean, I, I don't know. I'd have to do a quick calculation. Okay, that's a little better than I thought we were at. So I'm, that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Going to go through it next um, item. What's that? We're going to go right through it next item. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean. I guess my, my personal opinion is I, we did set a cap, and I'm, I'm really cautious about budget creep. Um, but if the rest of the council feels really strongly that um, they're okay with this, then I'm willing to, to go along with that. I think I'm just going to say I think that this sets a really dangerous precedent. I mean, I'm not going to – this is the last I want to comment on it. But I think that with every other item in this budget, we've set we, – I mean, with, within the budget, we have set a cap and said this is what the Montpelier voters can afford. And I think what I'm hearing from other counselors is that this is an area where we should say this should be needs-driven. And I think if that's going to be the case, you're going to see – I mean, you've already seen a lot more applicants. I suspect that's because it's a lot easier to apply for a grant uh, from your, this organization than it is to go on the ballot. And as 
time goes on, it becomes more apparent. It's easier for people to understand. It becomes more widely known, and your demand's going to grow. And so, and clearly, there's greater demand in this community for services than $115,000. I mean, I think that's just likely going to a number that people think that's in the range. But as it becomes known that this isn't a cap, this is just a program that's driven by need, you're going to see dramatic increases. And I think that's just not an appropriate way to set a budget. We make all kinds of difficult decisions within the context of what we can afford, not what we think we should be spending. And I think this is setting us that a, a different standard for this program that I think is going to result in some real significant uh, challenges in the future if that's the policy that the council wants to take. Just to challenge a couple of assumptions there, I mean, there is an application process that applicants have to go through, which is not the same as getting or the requisite number of signatures, which, I mean, requires certainly shoe leather politics because you got to go door to door. But putting together an application, I mean, I've written grant applications. That is not an easy process by any means. And I would frankly prefer people to go through this process because there are community members who are reviewing this, who are seeing what the services that are provided to Montpelier by this organization is the population served. I mean, I think that clearly, I think Bill articulated an issue that the city needs to address, which is when do we notify groups about what their limits are? You know, and, and I think that warrants a bigger conversation about, you know, these committees that we're asking to do this work. Um, but, but I think that this is the way to go. I mean, having a committee that reviews these applications rather than just going straight to the ballot, I mean, that way the city knows what it's spending its money on. When, when there's an application process, the city council gets a write-up of what the organization does, what the history is with this board and this organization. And, and to me, I mean, it, it sort of highlights a, a, a communication breakdown, which was this memo went out the same day that their meeting was. The understanding was a little bit different because the timing had been different in the past. So I think that the, the council or the city needs to set a clear deadline for when you know, when the city is going to get this information out and when the expectation that we receive information back is. Um, thank Michael. you for the, the comment. But I'd also like to point out that the, we had requests for $143,282. So it wasn't as if we were just, you know, going through, say, okay, not okay, okay, not okay. We had to make some decisions. We, we realized that there was a cap somewhere and that we, we, we were not, you know, um, and that we were constrained to make decisions based on what we thought was a, a fair presentation with also accountability for what money had been allocated the previous years, reviewing that. And in, in a couple of cases, uh, we reduced the, we, we gave less because we felt that we had not received information that showed how the money that had been given the previous years had been spent. So I think. Um, it's not as if we were simply giving a pass to everybody who walked in the door. Um, and, and, I, and I think that that's important to, re to recognize. Also, in one case, we, I mean, the, 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 the issue of the, the feast money being suddenly moved from the community fund into the budget had two effects, I think. One was to say, okay, we, we, um, we don't have we, we don't have that, we, we appear not to have that money, but it also, just basics, had put in an application for two new projects, which we thought were important. And so the question was, do we penalize one applicant because some of their money has already been moved somewhere else without, you know, t t out of our authority at this point? And so we say, well, they've got their money, we will just sort of dismiss the other projects that came. Um, and we decided that that didn't seem to be a good idea either. Um, and um, although I, and, and I'm a little reluctant to do this, but I will say it anyway, two applicants who had been receiving money steadily over the years missed the deadline, and they happen to be on the ballot now. So, you know, there's a case where, you know, it was not, if we had had their applications in as we had expected, we would have made <coughs> some, we, we would have made some other decisions to try to accommodate what we saw as, you know, as a need that's being met, but with with a project. So, I think the the committee uh, um, was put in a kind of difficult position by all of a sudden having this less less money here, um, with, with very little notice and with really um, some pretty bad options to to pursue if 
um, you know, give, given those, those circumstances. If I might just add one data point to Michael's uh, point, I would just say that Just Basics proposal this year indicated a 66% increase in the number of people that they're serving now this year over last. Okay, over here, at Justin and then Donna. If you look at the list of these nonprofits on page seven of the agenda, these are groups that are helping people in our community. And I am strongly in favor of letting them do what they do best, which is to keep helping people and not have to tramps around collecting hundreds of signatures, which is really distracting them from their core function. I would move to accept and fund the Montpelier Community Fund as recommended for FY19. I would second that. All right, further discussion? Donna, do you have anything else? No, nope, nope, that's what I was going to say. All right. <laughs> Uh, all right, hearing no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Thank you all very much for your work. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Let's move to the next year. Okay, next item, uh, budget public hearing. Did you have another? Yeah, I was going to do one. In fact, I have, um, I actually have, my PowerPoint covers the budget, the bonds, the charter, and the warning. So we'll just run through the. I can split them up, or we can just run through the whole thing, and then you may make some changes. Are you setting up a PowerPoint? Yeah. Can we take a, a break? Sure, can. Oh, I. It's not me to tell you that. <laughs> oh, hello, everybody. Um, I've actually drafted outlines of the four issues that are up for public uh, hearings, and um, I also have this PowerPoint for the school superintendent Brian Rickas here, who wants to quickly go through the school budget as well so when I'm completed he'll do his thing I think um, so uh, just with the caveat that all the budget numbers I'm going to give you are now $9,500 short uh, <laughs> so um, having said that so I, I'm going to walk through the proposed budget the bond issues the charter changes and the annual meeting warning uh, obviously those can still be addressed individually but I just put them all together so the budget uh, is as, as was approved by the council on, the, on January 10, and it's subject to additional changes made tonight, as we've seen. Uh, the council set, the budget is based around council goal of uh, affordability. Uh, this is a, requires a 2.3% tax rate increase, which approximates CPI. That includes all the, again, prior to the 9,500, all of the ballot items and everything else that's in uh, on the ballot. Personnel costs were up only 1.5%, and uh, we used our long-term budget as a guide. I'm not going to read all of these, just hit some of the key highlights. One of our goals is good governance. The, the, um, the budget included many of the things that we had consisted in our goals. One of the things we hope to accomplish was a citizen survey, which isn't in included, but we'll take a look at maybe other ways of funding that. Uh, public safety is important, and we funded our public safety uh, departments uh, at, at sufficient levels uh, we weren't able to expand in some areas that we'd hoped and, um, and we and the council has chosen to put the CVPSA ballot item on as well economic development we've kept the hundred thousand dollars in funding for the Montpelier Development Corporation we've kept our planning staff to implement our new zoning and master plan and we are continuing to support a possible TIF application housing we uh, Last year, we increased the housing for the housing trust fund from 21,000 to 60,000, and we kept that funding at the same this year. Keep uh, has funds for uh, completing one Taylor Street. Quality of life, uh, many of the things that have been uh, included before the downtown improvement district, Montpelier Alive, community enhancements, downtown projects are all included. Um, in our healthy and welcoming community, we uh, kept funding uh, in the parking fund for alternative transportation. We kept funding for the bike path, our community and arts fund that we just talked about, and the feast program, which was moved to the senior center. For infrastructure, we've got a CIP plan, which was fully funded. We're proposing two bonds for infrastructure improvements. We've added an engineering position in DPW and uh, continued other plans that we've had. For environment, we continued funding for the Energy Advisory Committee, stormwater projects, and uh, we just talked about the GMT circulator bus. Um, so very quickly, where does the money come from? As you can see, our budget is funded about 65% from property taxes, uh, others grants, revenues, and fund transfers, so some of uh, uh, transfers between the water fund, parking fund, sewer fund. Where do we spend it? Uh, you can see the bulk is in public safety and in infrastructure. 
uh, community services and our general government services. Uh, taking a look at cutting that slightly differently and I know I'm going quickly because I know we have a lot to talk about tonight. There's a huge amount of detail on all of this if anybody's interested, happy to provide or answer any questions. Uh, cutting uh, the this uh, separately, you can see that uh, it, we are about 55%, 54% of personnel. Uh, we've got our capital plan, ballot items are about 3%, uh, operating costs about 20%. Uh, so what does that mean? Our, our property tax rate would rise from 1.055 cents to 1.079 cents. It's 2.4 cents or 2.3 percent. Average tax bill of about $55. Our other rates, uh, water and sewer rates, are planned to 2.5 percent. And other rates, uh, well, no increase in the sewer and CSO benefit uh, rates. Just this is a quick chart. This will be in your annual report. It's just taking a look of, at each service we provide breaking up our budget and then netting out any revenues that that department generates. So this is the net tax cost for our various services. And it's just, uh, you can see how much the average tax bill play, pays for various services. So just under $500 for police and 350 for public works, 340 for fire, EMS, et cetera. So you can see kind of what, what your a la carte looks like. Uh, we, so that's the end of the budget. <laughs> Uh, again, happy to answer questions on all of this. Uh, we are proposing two bonds. One is a uh, water and sewer bond for water lines on Main Street, Lagu, Canal, and Clarendon. 500000 for sewer lines on Lagu, Canal, and, and uh, Clarendon. So obviously the, some of that work is coordinated. The, the Main Street line is the line near the middle school that's given us failure problems. And uh, it's allowed doing that. General fund infrastructure bond is for uh, 450000 to complete the alternate transportation path, 360000 for sidewalk improvements, and 490000 for the one Taylor project, the Taylor Street project, and other accelerated infrastructure if needed. So we don't have to float the whole bond, but we've talked about moving, trying to speed up some of our improvements. There's also a $4.9 million bond for school imp improvements, which I will leave to Superintendent Ricca to discuss. So those are the the bonds that will be on the ballot. And uh, the numbers inside 11, 12, and 13 are currently the um, ballot, the article numbers on the ballot, in case you're wondering what those are. Um, charter change. The city's proposing four charter changes, also required to have a public hearing tonight. The first one reflects the creation of the new Montpelier Roxbury School District, so it basically deletes a whole section of language about the Montpelier School Department and reflects this new uh, independent uh, district. The second is to amend election filing deadlines to coincide with the general state statute. Our current charter currently uh, has its own filing deadline for candidacy, which doesn't match any other community and uh, the other the general statute. So we're uh, amending that. So we'll be in sync with neighboring uh, communities and with other across the state. Mm -hmm. The third charter change amends the size of the DRB and sets specific terms for the DRB and Planning Commission members. Uh, we currently have five members on the DRB, but uh, have functioned with seven for a long time. So this is amending the charter to um, actually make it seven and also setting a specific end, beginning and end date for terms. Right now, our, our members of these committees are, are all over the place. So we want to have, there'll be one date, I think it's May for the Planning Commission and October for the DRB that will appoint all of the people for those set terms at those times. And finally, um, we're eliminating the collections of personal property tax uh, for items valued under $10,000. Uh, so these are, um, can often be $2, you know, if the value is 10, the, 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 uh, the bill is $1.56 or $3 or something like that. So um, $30. So we are uh, eliminating the nuisance collection of those small personal property taxes. Uh, that's the charter changes. Uh, oops, sorry. And then the warning is it's currently drafted. I know there will be considerations of adding other items or changing items, but the first three items are the election of city school and public safety authority officers. The next three items are city school and public safety authority budgets. So the next three items are the compensation for elected officials, mayor, city council, and school uh, board members. Uh, the authorization for the school reserve fund, which is an annual appropriation. Uh, the 11 through 13 are the three city and school bonds I just went over. 14 is the annual authorization for the downtown improvement district. 15 is the funding for the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Uh, 16 through 19 are the four charter changes I just outlined. 
20 to 22 are the three agency uh, petitions that we've received, presuming they are put on the ballot. And then there's uh, 23, there's a non non financial <coughs> petition regarding state renewable energy policy. So the, that is the draft budget as it sits right now. Uh, and again, we need to have a public hearing on all of that. So that's quickly running through the four items. Uh, certainly can talk about any of these in any more detail. Uh, oh, excuse me. So with regard to the warning, I, this is related to the whole overall budget. Um, when you look at the tax distribution, this just shows with the city, school, and everybody else in there. You can see how your tax breaks out. And this is the overall picture to answer the question. So with all in, including school, we're looking at about 2.4% increase um, with everybody included. So that, so when you look at the warning as a whole, if everything passed, this is what it would have looked like uh, coming into tonight. Uh, so tonight is the public hearing. Uh, the voting is on Tuesday, March 6th, 7 to 7, with the early voting slated to start on February 9th, I'm told. Well, registering for requesting an early ballot is already under right. the, the ballot strength will be available. Okay, so that's... Uh, that is the schedule. So any questions or comments? Uh, and obviously these are public hearings, so happy to take anyone's um, questions. And that's it. Four public hearings in one. <laughs> oh, excuse me. No, now we got the school. Almost got out of Can I make one comment on that? You sure may. Um, so I just wanted to mention briefly the um, increase in compensation, compensation for the council and the mayor. Um, I noticed that the um, reporter from the Times Argus wasn't there that night, and so that did not get covered in any of the various local newspapers. Um, and I didn't want anybody to think that we were slipping that in, um, or anyone to compare what we, you know, had put in this year or last year and think that that was trying to be done secretively. Um, it's not mentioned in the warning that it's a change. So um, just throwing that out there that you can go back and watch, um, you know, our discussion on that. We had we had some discussion on that in a previous meeting, um, but I just. It wasn't intended to be hidden in there. Do you have a PowerPoint as well, or should we turn the lights up? Okay. Um, and as the superintendent uh, comes to this circle here, I just want to um, recognize that I'm a uh, employee of the school district, and so I'm going to be recusing myself for this portion of the conversation. Thank you and good evening. I will try to do as well as Bill did with my budget. Um, I would like to summarize uh, briefly and succinctly the work that we have done in the FY19 budget for, as Bill mentioned, the Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools. Um, with the merger that was passed um, in June, we are planning for four schools next year, the three here in town and the Roxbury Village School. Uh, the budget that we are about to run through with you contains no reductions in force and is framed in the unified district's motto of personalization, community, and sustainability, backed by our continuous improvement plan. On December 1st, Vermont Digger reported that per pupil spending is growing faster than the Vermont economy or Vermont wages and that the average tax rate is going up 9.4 cents or 7% on average. As of tonight, the Montpelier tax increase on the education side is less than half of what was predicted. Right now we're looking at 4.3 cents, and that is an increase of 2.6%, not the 7 that was predicted. What that looks like is $43 per 100,000 of assessed house value. According to the city manager, the average home in Montpelier is at $228,000, meaning an increase on the education side. No, you're fine. Oh. You're fine. You can go back. Um, meaning an increase on the education side of $98 or a little less than $25 a quarter for education taxes. For the Roxbury community, their education taxes will decrease by 2.5 cents. Recently, Governor Scott has called for school districts that have rising enrollment, like Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools has and will continue to have through at least the next three fiscal years to increase their equalized per pupil spending by no more than 2.5%. 
As Mayor Holler knows from his time on the school board, this is the most important figure to concern yourselves with when you think about education spending in the state of Vermont. Our current increase is more than a percentage point below what Governor Scott has called for. It is 1.3% on our education spending per pupil. If not for the capital plan, which is included in our operating budget, and the bond, which is a separate issue, a separate article, we would be returning money to the Montpelier taxpayers for the second year in a row. The Agency of Education and the Agency of the Administration have suggested that there be at least a 5 to 1 adult to student ratio in pre-K-12 delivery systems of education in the state of Vermont. Ours is predicted to be, or excuse me, ours is currently 5.3 to 1. Please understand that we did not build our budget to meet or exceed these goals. We built this budget to ensure a successful merger, one of our themes, to focus on equity and personalization, and to meet all of the needs in the schools, the four schools that serve three grade levels in two communities with one motto, personalization, community, and sustainability. Another goal for the, from the school board this year was to stabilize our future year tax rates. As you may know, part of the incentives for a merger include um, a, tax, a tax cent reduction. This year we'll see an eight cent tax reduction, a six cent next year, four cent the following year, two cents the following year, and so on until we're at a level fund with Roxbury. And so we've purposefully built in um, costs this year, one-time costs that will not be there for next year's um, uh, operating budget to absorb the two cent reduction, which would, if you think about it, look like a two cent increase. Some of the challenges that we face, there's an estimated education fund shortfall of about $80 million statewide. Um, and at the end of last year's legislative session, there was the health care compromise, which included a clawback of an additional $65,000 onto next year's budget. Um, and we saw a 10.1% rate increase on our health care. Um, and the challenges continued in terms of our tax rate. We saw a significant drop in the dollar yield um, and an increase in the non-residential tax rate to backfill the Ed Fund. The dollar yield is a number that is set by the legislature. We were expecting it to go up perhaps a percentage point. It actually dropped 3.1%. Um, and so that's been a big factor for us. Next page, please. Thank you. So here is our residential tax rate calculation. I will try to do this without boring you too much. Our operating budget is here. The combined, uh, you'll see, I'll start over here. This was our operating budget last year as Montpelier. Rock, as Montpelier. This was Roxbury's operating budget. So only for this year will you see this combined, or else I wouldn't be able to give you any comparisons in terms of what the two districts did. Our operating budget this year that we're proposing is $23,084,695. Our grant funds are in this number here. We're proposing a capital plan, which is in the operating budget already, and the proposed bond that we have that I'll go through briefly in a few slides will include a first-year interest-only payment of $118,000. So, moving down further, our total general fund budget is the $23,452,706. From that, you subtract the non-tax revenues of almost $4 million. This right here is our education spending number of $19.5 million. From the blue box here, this is a 6.5% increase. Without our capital plan and the bond, it would only be 4.5%. So 2% of this is being driven by much needed attention to our buildings. Our equalized pupils, and this is the really good news, folks. Um, in Montpelier alone, we had equalized pupils, which is not a head count. It's a weighted two-year calculation of the number of students that we have. Um, I won't bore you with the calculation, but suffice it to know it's not an actual head count. Plus our Roxbury cohort added in at 86. Again, that's not a head count. It's a weighted to your average. So we were looking at about 1165 or so. Um, our calculation came in over 1200. And this is the first time this number has been over 1200 in the seven years that I've uh, served in Montpelier. And it's an increase of 60. That directly drives down the local tax rate. So as we gain more students, um, the tax rate in town decreases. And so with the education spending here of $19.5 million divided by the equalized pupils, this is our education pupil, this is our ed spending per pupil, the number that is most important in terms of how taxes are calculated. And as I said, this is an increase of only 1.3%. Had we not included the capital plan and the bond, this would actually be a reduction um, in the education spending in town. 
Uh, there's no excess spending penalty, as you see Roxbury had one last year. There's no excess spending penalty here. And our adjusted ed spending per pupil is 15, 9, 23, 77, the same number. This number that's highlighted in yellow is the property dollar yield. Um, it was delivered as by statute on December 1st by the tax commissioner, but it has to be set by the legislature before it adjourns in May, and there's no telling what will happen to that between now and then, so we're basing this on the tax commissioner's letter. So when you take the ed spending per pupil divided by the property yield, you get an equalized residential tax rate of 161.8. You see here for Montpelier, there's the eight cent tax reduction that is our merger incentive. Um, and then as I've said, I think consistently for the past six years that I've done this, the backhanded compliment is that the CLA went down again um, in town. And our estimate here is that that uh, impacted our tax rate by, by about 3.3%. What that means, um, it's, a, it's a calculation that's used to ensure that people are paying the same level um, regardless of the town that they live in. And the fact that the Montpelier CLA is going down means there continues to be a lot of competition for housing in Montpelier. And so people are paying more than the assessed value um, for the house. So with all of that said, here is the tax rate for um, Montpelier that I shared with Bill, $1.66 and a little higher. Um, the Roxbury one is over here. Their CLA also went down, um, and they're paying um, $1.69. Um, okay. Residential tax rate impacts, as I shared, about $43 per um, $100,000. It works out to be a little bit less than um, $100 on the education side for the average home in Montpelier. As you can see, the Roxbury folks, are um, they have decreased. Please note, though, um, and this is apparently going to be a topic for conversation in the legislature, households with un income under $90,000, which is about 60% statewide, um, have income sensitivity, so may not be paying the entire amount that you see here. Um, this is a big topic of conversation. Our 706 committee, the merger study of which the new board chair, Jim Murphy, who's here with me, um, did a tremendous amount of work in order to try to predict how much we were going to spend. The ed spending was predicted to be about $18.9 million from the Ranger Study Committee, and we came in um, closer to 19.5. But as you see here, it did not include the capital plan, interest for the first year of a bond. And this is the number that I was telling you about. We've put almost $200,000 in one-time expenses into this operating budget that will not be there next year in order to absorb um, not only the two cents uh, less of a merger incentive, but also in the second year of a bond, you pay interest and principal. And so that will be um, a substantial uptick. But uh, the part of the method to the madness was to put in as much as we thought we could do reasonably in terms of one-time facilities funds that are facilities projects that won't be there next year. And that's separate from the capital plan, and that's separate from the bond. So we are taking a real hard look at improving the quality of our buildings. Um, we've had special education costs that we can never always budget appropriately for, but please note that there is um, state reimbursement for all of those. Um, and the Roxbury deficit that they came to the table with is being covered by our overall fund balance. Again, the committee estimated about a 1.48 residential tax rate. We came in at 1.54, and here are the big cost drivers to that. Last year, the, um, the merger study committee ante anticipated a little bit more for um, the dollar yield. It came in at 98.42. That difference right there is 7.4 cents. Um, if that's um, even level funded from last year, we're right at the number that they um, recommended. And that doesn't even include the capital plan, bond, the higher one-time projects was about 5 cents. And um, in that study, they estimated equalized pupils at 11.80, which was a modest increase, and we came in um, a bit higher. This is the list of bond projects and estimates. Um, the board asked us during the January 10th meeting to come in under $5 million. We were slightly over. All of these projects um, are in a state of, if not critical, approaching critical. UES um, has work that needs to be done on the electrical power distribution, fire alarm and PA, as well as elevator replacement. Um, a renovation of the playground that we are trying desperately to get off the ground, if we can ever get the soils to where they need to be. Um, and we're calling this new improved area of MHS our wellness and arts wing. It includes auditorium renovations, wellness center and training room, locker rooms, um, offices and a family restroom, as well as classroom improvement to the restrooms in the lobby, roof replacements and an upgrade of heating and ventilation. 
most of which have not had a lot of attention in the past easily 20 to 25 years. Um, notably, Main Street Middle School is not there, but I want to point out that in the past year and a half, we've spent over $400,000 using um, not only facilities fees, but reserve funds to make adjustments to the work at Main Street Middle School. And as you'll see on the next slide, the bathroom renovations are the second item in FY20. And based on the timing of the bond, if it passes, and the construction cycle, including um, mostly summer work, it's probable that the MSMS bathrooms are going to be replaced about the same time that the work begins in earnest um, on some of the big projects last year, or this year. Um, and this was another desire of the board to see a capital plan. Um, this year, this capital plan is built right into the operating budget. So we do have $250,000 set aside for roof replacement at the high school. Um, next year, we anticipate this being a capital fund, which would be a separate ballot item. But because the board was contemplating a bond, we wanted to go ahead and put the money in for this year and show not only the board but the public how serious we are about caring for our buildings going forward. You can see we're ranging in costs from about 250000 to 280000 These first two years are pretty much set and are hard numbers. We know these projects we're going to do. As we get further out, these are softer numbers, and but we also want to give everybody, not only on the board but in the community, a sense of the care that we're trying to take for all of our buildings. Um, as we look forward, the dollar yield should not decrease as drastically. We're hoping it doesn't ever drop another 3% and have to backfill the Ed Fund as much. Our equalized pupil count shouldn't increase as drastically. At the same time, it is projected to increase at least over the next three years, and that's only good news for folks in town. Um, our, as I mentioned a number of times, the tax incentive decreases two cents per year, um, but we have planned for what that's going to look like, and the board was very clear that they want to make sure that the tax rate is somewhere remotely close to stabilization among the um, factors that we can control. Enrollment and staffing, we're both likely to see increases through FY22, and that impact should be minimal as our, as our pupil growth grows, our spending per pupil should be about the same. Um, we're gonna see some expenditures decreasing as part of the merger. There was grandparenting instead of grandfathering for students in Roxbury who already had school choice. Um, so we will tuition the students who are in 9th through 12th grade, and then the following year it will only be 10th through 12th grade, 11th through 12th grade, and finally only 12th graders. This year's 7th graders at Roxbury Village School, sorry, this year's 6th six, grader. No, wait a minute. This, if there's someone who's in 7th grade, this year's 7th graders will come to Montpelier Public Schools next year as 8th graders. Um, so starting from 7th grade down, all students in Roxbury Village School will come to Montpelier Public Schools for grades 5 through 12, Main Street Middle School and Montpelier High School. We're going to see a, de a decrease as we go forward um, in the one-time facilities projects. Um, we're hoping to see transportation aid increase, but we won't see that for two years until FY21. We're going to be adding buses, and that's part of what's built into our overall budget. We need to not only have um, buses to continue to bring students in Roxbury to the Roxbury Village School. They already have a contract. Um, that we'll be working with to change, but we need to have a bus to bring not only students from Roxbury to Montpelier, but also the board is committing to having a late bus or a late van to ensure that Roxbury Village students can participate in co-curriculars and after-school activities. Um, and in terms of bond expenditures, the existing bond payments are going to be fairly level. Uh, the facilities bonds are going to decrease, but our Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System bond is going to increase, but that we've known that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the new bond that hopefully will be passed that we're taking on is going to see a large increase in FY20, but will decrease each year afterward. Bottom line, it's a 1.3% increase in per pupil spending, and that is excellent news and a credit to the board and the leadership team for ensuring that the work that we are doing is at a manageable spending amount. Um, and I will continue to remind folks it would be um, a return on education taxes if we did not include the capital plan and bond, which we need. The overall residential tax rate increase is 2.6%, and it's 1.5% decrease for Roxbury. <coughs> and I'd be happy to take questions if people have. I just need to ask, are, do this, the council need to vote on we do. this? Okay, we do. I need to recuse myself as well. I did not realize that okay. because of my position with the agency of education. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Brian. Any questions for Jim or Brian? It's largely a formality. We don't have the uh, any control of the budget, but I appreciate all of your work. I would just comment briefly that, you know, in talking to people from U32 surrounding towns, too, they're constantly curious about how things are going here in Montpelier, and I'm proud to say I tell them we've got some great schools here. Thank you for both for making that happen. Thank CLA you. is also, you know, numeric evidence to some degree mm -hmm. of the interest in living in Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion to approve that part, or do we do should everything? open the public hearing, too. Oh, for okay, so public we hearings have on budget, public bonds, charter. But do we have a separate vote on this no. item? But when you set the warning, you put the yeah, house item on. About, okay, great. Okay, so this is a public hearing for our budget or any other items been discussed. Any of it want to have any comments? Okay, so uh, what's our next, I guess? Yeah, I mean, this is, the public hearing would be on any of these items. So the budget, the charter, and the bonds that you've heard about. Okay, I'm not hearing any comments on those. So then we have the petitions, too. Consider. Turn that over to the city clerk. <laughs> um, well, you've heard you've heard Bill's description of the uh, charter items and they're the same ones that you all approved before, so you're probably uh, familiar with them. Um, they are going to well you've you've also seen the warning so you'll be you'll see how they will appear on there which does make it incumbent on us to um, make the actual text as available as widely as possible including printing it out and putting it every uh, voting booth um, but I don't know if you all have any questions about any of them mm -hmm. pretty straightforward I yeah. think We've covered them all thank you and then there was a request to add an item to the the next is the CV the Central Vermont Internet right so we oh. do have somebody here Jeremy's here I think to make that presentation did you Donna this was your request to put yes. this on the agenda did you have anything you wanted to comment about uh, know that I hope that we support putting it on the ballot and that voters will support it it's an opportunity for us to grade community-wide fiber so we're confused um, so <laughs> could we separate out these items just because I would I would prefer to not vote on the uh, the school portion of it um, you don't actually have to vote on a school portion all you do is vote to approve the warning when mm. we put those school items on so when we vote for the warning you could just recuse yourself on the two school articles okay. okay just note for the record I don't think it's it's a real you don't we can't change gotcha right. okay there's nothing because I'm really excited to <laughs> <laughs> did you did you turn the projector off? I did, but I can I can undo that. Sorry, I'm not the word. Back. So he, he does have this as an attachment to our agenda as well as what he's presenting, in case you want to know. Your mics, pull them. Okay. How's that? There we go. So, uh, thanks for having me tonight. Uh, I'm Jeremy Hansen. Um, I'm a professor down at Norwich University. I teach computer security, programming, networking, all this stuff. I'm also on the select board in Berlin. I've been there for a bit. Um, before I came to Vermont, um, I spent about 10 years in information technology and security working for all sorts of different size organizations, doing all sorts of different things. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm proposing is actually something that's not terribly different from something that Montpelier is already involved in. So there's a group called EC Fiber, which operates primarily to the south of us, down from about Brookfield all the way down to West Windsor. Um, but it's this thing called the Communications Union District, which is something like a water district or a school district, but it's an internet district. And um, arguably, EC Fiber will at some point be building out Montpelier with um, high-speed fiber to the home. Um, 
but um, we are essentially looking to clone what they're doing to the south of us here in central Vermont. And I'll show you the list of towns that have this on the ballot already um, in just a bit. But just to um, make sure you have the whole picture for people who aren't familiar with this, um, we're looking at creating this municipal entity. And this is a municipal entity that's separate from Montpelier. It doesn't have the same uh, um, budget. It can't take tax money from any of the towns. Um, and Montpelier would be insulated from liability on any of the, um, any of the building, any of the construction um, that would happen. So it turns out that the, Vermont, the Vermont's telecommunications plan says that by the end of 2020, that uh, half of addresses in Vermont, more than half of addresses in Vermont should have 100 megabits per second symmetric, which means stuff that you download from the internet, you should get 100 megabits per second, stuff that you send to the internet should that should happen at 100 megs per second. According to the statistics that I have from the state, there are zero addresses in Montpelier that have this. Of all of the towns that I've talked to in central Vermont, there are zero that, that meet this requirement. And then it says by 2024, every address should, should meet this. And um, we are not really on track to hit this. I think we have something like, um, 13%, it's in, the, it's in the teens percent of addresses in Vermont that actually hit this. And the reason that we're at that number is because of Burlington and a couple other towns, mostly EC fiber towns to the south. So I'm looking at um, you know, building this municipality with Montpelier's help and all the other communities that I'm working with um, to essentially build fiber to the home, um, connecting homes with up to gigabit fiber connections. So this is a picture of, of Montpelier, and you see, so all the green dots, which kind of get mashed together downtown, all the green dots are addresses, E911 addresses. All of the red lines are roads that have at least cable infrastructure coverage. Montpelier has cable basically everywhere. So almost every address in Montpelier, you, you have a choice between cable or DSL. The surrounding communities, uh, including Berlin, where, where my house is, and I don't live very far away from here. I'm just off the map near, near Berlin Pond. I, I have DSL at best. So I could go to wireless broadband, I could go to satellite, but those aren't really options if I want to do real work from home. Um, so what I'm asking of Montpelier is for Montpelier to help us create this district. This district doesn't exist. There's no board, there's no entity right now. So I'm asking you to add the language to your ballot to, that says, shall the city of Montpelier enter into this communications union district to be known as Central Vermont Internet under the provisions of 30 VSA Chapter 82 in a similar way as you did when you joined with EC Fiber. Um, so again, member towns are insulated from the financial activities of the district. You can't use tax money. Um, there's a hook in there that says the statute requires that each member shall make available for lease to the district one or more sites for a communications plant or components thereof within such member municipality. Um, I think EC Fiber only does this with three or four other towns, and this is basically where they need to create sort of satellite satellite locations, and that would not be more than, for those of you tech geeks in the crowd, 2U of rack space, or something roughly the size of your average, average desktop computer. Um, should this pass at a uh, city meeting, and we have at least two towns that vote affirmatively on this, the municipalities involved would appoint a CVI board member, much like you appoint an EC Fiber board member and an alternate, and that's it. Um, nobody votes on bonds. The, bond, the bonding that happens with, with these districts is different. You've probably not noticed EC Fiber going out to the bond market and like, you know, bringing the votes in front of Montpelier residents. It's because it's, it's separate, it's different. So uh, why would we do this? Um, a lot of the existing ISPs don't really have the motivation to provide this really, truly high-speed internet. Um, if they did, we would have seen more construction. We would have seen evidence that this is actually happening. We also get local governance. There's somebody from Montpelier who's going to be responsible for the decisions that this district makes. You get local control, local accountability, and in a lot of cases, important to some people, local tech support. There'll be somebody in central Vermont answering the phone to fix problems when it comes up. Um, I had the uh, opportunity to go visit EC Fiber's um, office, their location, 
and get a sense of what's going on with them. And they've been extremely helpful and very willing to help us, help CVI get off the ground and, uh, and make this happen. So um, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty lean but really effective operation that they have going on down there. Um, so because there's no profit motive and because um, this district can tap, to, tap into the municipal bond market, we can offer cheaper rates than we might see than if, if, you know, if I was coming to you and saying, I'm starting my own for-profit um, fiber optic internet service provider. Um, we're, we're also, I'm hoping, if I have any say about it, we will have net neutrality written into statement of principles from the get-go. There's not going to be any negotiating or arguing or worrying what the federal government does or whether the state can say anything about that. We start square one, no, no filtering based on content, no throttling. Um, the FCC has also making, made moves recently to give ISPs the ability to track and resell subscriber network activity, which to me as a privacy advocate is really gross. Um, and then I, I, I won't bother pitching to you why this is important for economic development, um, but it could also have the side effect of also indirectly driving prices of other, the other offerings down and speeds up. <coughs> All right, so I'm talking to you tonight. You're up at the top there. I'm talking to Barry City, whom I've already I talked to. I pitched this to them already um, back in November-ish. Um, but already on the town meeting ballot, Barrytown, Berlin, Callis, East Montpelier, Marshfield, Middlesex, Northfield, Plainfield, Roxbury, Williamstown, Worcester. So I want to point out something um, that didn't occur to me until recently, Roxbury. If you have students going to Rox uh, from Roxbury going to um, Montpelier High School and they have homework assignments that require um, use of the internet, Roxbury is at 0% coverage with cable modems. They will have DSL at best, which means maybe uh, one megabit connections. If they're in, if they're in better places closer, closer to um, one of the state highways, they could get, they might get eight, they might get 10 megabits per second. Okay. Um, so some of the criticisms that, that we see is I don't want my taxes to go up for something I don't want. This is like, this is like the sewer, you don't pay, if you're not on the sewer line, you don't pay for the sewer. This is the same thing. Taxes in statute, it says you can't use tax money, tax capacity to pay for this district. I don't want to be in the same position as Burlington Telecom. Burlington Telecom is a weird and unfortunate situation and this is a different structure that insulates Montpelier from having late night meetings to midnight <laughs> over and over and over again. I wouldn't, I mean, I've been to my share of, of long select board meetings, and I am not interested in inflicting that on anyone. Um, and having a bunch of these providers failed, sure, just like any other business, any other thing, any other effort could fail. That's absolutely true that it, that it has happened and could happen, and I'm, you know, it's possible that this won't work. I'm going to be completely, completely straight. But if EC Fiber is any indication, after three years of operation as a um, Communications Union District, they're cash flow positive after three years, and they're still building out more towns. They're building out all of Brookfield. Brookfield is not, not very dense. They're building out all of Brookfield with gigabit speed fiber to every house. Um, if there's truly the demand, wouldn't the market correct to provide the supply? Um, maybe, but again, we're not seeing that. There hasn't been new construction in, much new construction in Berlin or Northfield. Those are the communities I'm most familiar with working in, in Northfield. Um, aren't the towns covered by satellite and wireless broadband already? Sure, but those are, and I'm happy to go into the reasons why um, that's not a, a legitimate criticism of, it's essentially because the way people use the internet, um, that when it requires a lot of bandwidth, it's, these solutions are not going to be satisfactory, essentially. Um, there's no guarantee they'll actually provide cheaper service or faster speeds. I can guarantee that there's going to be faster speeds. I mean, this is um, fiber optic to your house. We're talking about 700 megabits per second. EC fiber charges $150 a month for. Um, will it actually be cheaper? Don't know. We haven't written the business plan or gone to the bond market yet. Do you, do you know if EC fiber prices? Yep. So $66 a month is what they charge for 17 megabits per second up and down. It's actually the next bit in your, in your packet right below this presentation. Um, so um, 
So yeah, so my, my agenda was to finish up getting the, the, the language on the town meeting ballot in the, the more than 10 towns, and then go to public outreach and awareness building, so getting people to know, you know, what's all this kind of legalese stuff that's on the ballot that's talking about this communications union district. Talk to more people, put this out there. Hopefully win approval at town meeting, appointing representatives to the board, and then kind of as we go, looking for, you know, um, organizations and people who are interested in providing seed money or otherwise being like anchor institutions. First annual meeting in May, possibly add other municipal members, and then we start talking about feasibility studies, looking for where we're going to start, draft a business plan, a budget, initial coverage. And um, because this question keeps coming coming up over and over, I mean, I'm knocking on doors in, in Northfield, and they're saying, so when am I actually going to have possibilities of fast internet? And I was like, if, if we were coming here, I couldn't imagine the first construction happening before 2020, just in terms of getting the organizational structure complete, getting the money and actually permitting and construction and all that stuff. So there's that language for the ballot again. There's me. And I'll shut up. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. Uh, any questions for Jeremy? Comments? Um, stand. No question necessarily, but uh, just a comment that uh, if the municipality is responsible for paving roads uh, in our city, uh, basically what we're talking about here is effectively kind of an analogous. It is the roads of, sort of modern culture. So, um, and while this isn't strictly a utility is participating as a um, as a member of sort of a joint utility and uh, I think um, you know the the risks are minimal uh, to the city and I'm, I'm really excited to move forward with this Other questions just I really appreciated your having uh, the EC fiber rates here uh, just below the presentation <clears throat> and I noticed that um, well it may um, be more bandwidth the, the prices were quite a bit higher than what I'm paying from Fairpoint or mm -hmm. right now or consolidated communications would joining this collective in any way restrict for-profit companies from offering their products in Montpelier no, just be another option thank you not I realize this, this entity doesn't exist yet since we're waiting for town meeting day, but I would encourage you to explore what a potential co-op might look like um, going forward if this entity is approved, sort of seeing what that might look like as we move forward, depending on how many towns or where those towns are that agree to it. Um, I, I mean, I think it makes sense. I, I moved up here from Boston, and the internet speeds are, <laughs> I, it's like unacceptable. <laughs> um, so I, I applaud your work on this. Um, I'd make a motion that we put this item on the ballot. Do you like me to read it word for word, John I Odom? So. Uh, I would rather you send it to me. It, it's, <laughs> it's right here on the agenda format. Okay. Shall the then city, I can go and copy it from the city of Montpelier enter into communication you want me just to email to you, John? district to be known as Central Vermont Internet okay. under the provision of 30 VSA Chapter 82. Is there a second? Second. Is there <laughs> discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thanks Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everybody. Do you want this back, though? Oh, thank you. Oh, you can just leave it. I'm not going to be using it again, so thanks. No. It's an additional Thank you. Got to put the warning in. Okay. So the next item is item 12, warning the public hearing. Right. So basically, um, I'm sorry. What are, it's yeah. the warning public hearing. The warning public hearing. So I already went through the, the ballot items that didn't include this item you've just added. So that would be a new item. And the number that on your draft warning for the budget, the city budget, would go up by $9,500. So those are the two changes you'd make before you approve the final warning. So we you need to have a public hearing on the warning. Okay. So do we have any comments on the warning? All right. Uh, if not, we will then go to item 13. The question is to approve the warning. Do we have a motion? So moved. With those Second. two changes. Second. Two changes being adding the CVI yes. and the $9,500 in the budget. Yes. Uh, seconds. Any discussion? Um, just as a note, I'm 
excusing myself from the, just the school portion of that. And likewise. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. We have so we have completed our work on the budget, and uh, we did make an earlier adjustment to the agenda to move up the discussion about the sprinkler ordinance, so we'll take that up now. So I guess we'll turn it over to the sprinkler committee to explain this. Since I didn't have a version of this with the additional ready for you all to sign, I'm going to run and make one. Just a, for a little while. <laughs> just a process question, yeah. too, uh, in terms of the, the ballot that we just approved. Since I had pulled the bond decision from the consent agenda uh, and it does appear on the ballot assuming that it, it is approved by the council are we not going to have that discussion or no we are going to have the discussion I just hadn't thought about that in the context of the budget so sure. we should probably go ahead and do that we do need uh, to approve uh, necessity resolutions before we yeah. put before we vote on them certainly so. just wanted to get clarity as to how Best to proceed here. Well, are those part of the budget, the necessity resolutions? We're on the consent agenda. I know, but are they part? They're not part of the. Are they part of the budget? They're, they're just approved. Well, they're related to the bond votes. That the bond votes are on the ballot. Ballot that you just approved. So we should. I guess it's if, up to if, you. If, I mean, if I think these we don't do pass, later, we can't we can go ahead with the bonds. So that's up to you. Well, we had already made uh, two amendments for. The ninety-five hundred dollars um, in EC fiber. Uh, since this item hadn't been discussed, uh, should we have that discussion before we uh, approve the ballot because it's in there? Uh, Which one? The, the necessity. The, the two bonds yeah. that are being proposed to put before voters. Okay, so why don't we take this up right now? Do you want to relay your sure? I um, concerns about that. You know, we spend quite a bit of time uh, talking about uh, less than ten thousand dollars to the community fund earlier tonight, and it did come to my attention that there were two fairly large bonds that are being put before voters uh, together totaling about two point six million dollars which um, is only about three hundred and twenty five dollars per person uh, divided by eight thousand so it's not a huge amount of money um, part of the reason I pulled it from the consent agenda is um, we have recently um, been informed of a number of different changes in pricing on projects um, starting with uh, the Northfield Street construction project where we bonded over a million dollars specific to road work there, um, a $400,000 increase uh, to our bike paths. Um, recently we got some new information about our wastewater recovery plant that was several million dollars off from initial estimates and some of that has to do with the scope of the work and, and when we're doing it but even not including methane digestion it was significantly different by many magnitudes of previous information that had been discussed uh, in the capital improvements projects and also included in the water and sewer plan that we approved in the summer of 2016. So my reason in raising this is um, we have an established process, a plan um, to uh, bond and I wanted to get some more information from the city manager because in looking at, uh, at least I certainly could have be an oversight on my part but in the documentation that I have coming out of the CIP committee or on that water sewer plan uh, bonding is identified on there and perhaps it's a it's a different kind of bonding but I just wanted to be sure that if it is for the sorts of things that we uh, propose bonding within these committees that it's, uh, it's we're acknowledging that we're making significant multi-million dollar departures from the plan that we have been talking about quite recently so I guess I'm looking for a little more information is if uh, these bonds are uh, separate from the ones that would be within the scope and are identified within the CIP and Not the water the sewer rates process. So I thought I'd explain all that when we presented the budget. This isn't new. These aren't new presentations. Um, the water and sewer bonds are specifically the bonds that are called for in the master plan. It calls for bond work for replacing. So these are specifically for upgrading water and sewer lines. Uh, so there was an, an, uh, there's so much set aside per year. Uh, but we had agreed we would, we thought we would be funding them in increments with, with bonding. So this is exactly what was planned on. And the general fund bond, as you recall, in the budget presentation, we recommend. So some of that was for uh, to accelerate. We talked specifically in the CIP committee about accelerating sidewalk work and other work to try to get ahead of the curve. And then we built in the uh, bike path funding, and it was came with the, the recommendation that next year 
uh, we'd add another fifty thousand dollars to the capital plan uh, above where we'd been to to accommodate that and recognizing that that was going to require an additional. I guess I'm a little confused then because in reviewing at least the documents that I have from the water and sewer master plan, it appeared as though there was bonding scheduled in 2018 and then not again until about 2023 for $450,000. And so we are talking about FY19 now, aren't we? This is 2018. We didn't break them. We, well, I don't know if Tom's here. Um, we, we talked about it's specifically to fund the water and sewer infrastructure that we had planned to fund. This is the but we bonded that last year as well, right? <coughs> Included in the Northfield part project. Of the Northfield Street project. That's correct. And this was to basically take the annual funding that we were going to put in and pay for it now, so we can get the streets done before the next hit. Also, in the CIP plan that I was looking at, it is you know recently, even over the last six months, I remember asking repeatedly. Do we need to readjust our bonding plan based on, you know, the adding this additional revenue or based on need of our infrastructure? And understand, uh, you're talking to a guy who loves to spend money on infrastructure here. Uh, what I'm concerned about is the process that we, we use to do that and also to make sure that uh, it's consistent with some of the work that is being done in committee. Um, not that we shouldn't spend this money this year. I guess I'm making this point so that council is fully aware that we seem to be building a fairly consistent track record of adding additional bonding, as far as I can tell, and I, I'm happy to sit down and, and look more at some of the documents that are coming out of these groups, um, to meet need, but my concern is that one of three things appears to be happening here. I'm going to say this quite plainly. Either we need to improve the way that we're anticipating need, if we thought Three million would be enough to fix the wastewater plant, and it turns out it's nine. Um, we need to sharpen our pencils and take a little closer look at that. Or prices for this sort of work are increasing dramatically, much, much faster than inflation. They're going up by this much. Or we are aware of the risk, but we're not fully communicating that back out. And so I just want to raise those three things because if we continue to um, bond, bonding is borrowing, it's, it's running up. Uh, like at home, if you use your credit card, um, there is a, a credit limit that this council or previous councils have established in terms of our bonding ceiling. And so by if we approve these bonds for the ballot and if voters approve this money, that will then uh, constrain future councils' ability to bond within that established policy. So for things like um, the methane digester, um, there will be $2 million less before you hit that ceiling and you'll either have to raise it um, and create a new policy or stay within our established policy. So that's really my intent uh, in raising this, to acknowledge that. Well, I'd just say, first of all, we did talk about all of these in the capital improvements process, and these were laid on the table in December. We've had several meetings uh, and public hearings to discuss this. This is the first time this question's been raised, so it's a little bit, uh, that seems a lot to me. Um, we, and, and I think the, the, the three versions that you've had are, are pretty simplistic uh, nuance. I mean, the wastewater plant, there's a, there's a whole lot more that goes to that. Uh, we have anticipated these needs. We've laid out the streets. These are clearly streets that need it. They're intended to match with one of the, the main concerns with the CIP plan was to make sure we were combining water and sewer work with paving work so that we weren't digging up. So that is exactly how this is laid out. Um, to accommodate that, uh, we have certainly looked at our bonding limits. I'm comfortable recommending these, and as I said, uh, I, I believe we'd explained all this when we laid it out. So I don't, I don't know what else I can add that will help you feel any better. Thank you. Okay, do we have a motion to approve these two items from our consent agenda? Unless there are no, I see no further comments I'll, on this. I'll make a motion to include second? these two bonding. Yeah, so to be clear, what you're approving here is necessity resolutions, which, I mean, essentially, they right. are, they're financial documents. They're not actually committing you to, to, to do the money. It just means, basically, we're saying we, it's a resolution that we don't have the money on hand to pay that we need to finance this. It doesn't commit you to actually do it, but, but these have to be done and so that we can go to the bond market. 
So res the motion should say that approve the two resolutions. Correct. To Just support items the bond. Items B and C on our consent agenda. Yes. Okay. Was there a second? Second. Any further discussion? I would just add that um, I would be happy uh, to put these before voters. Ultimately, they will have the decision as to whether they want to borrow this money. Um, if they appeared on the most recent versions of the documents uh, that lay out the plan for this sort of spending. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. Okay. So we will go to item. 16, the Sprinkler Ordinance discussion. All right. Um, so uh, the Sprinkler Ordinance Committee um, was appointed by this council and has met five times since October. Um, it was made up of myself, Councillor Watson, and Councillor Olson. Um, and we uh, spent, you know, some time learning about what the state law requirements are for sprinklers what the current city ordinance does um, and then we spent some time examining the various variances that had been granted by the um, so-called sprinkler variance committee it's technically um, the board of building code appeals or something like that in the in the ordinance but we call it the variance committee so um, we spent some time looking at uh, I think at least 13 variances that had been granted since 2013 um, to see you know what what was happening there um, we considered some options, and I laid all of those out for you um, in a memo, and I've detailed um, our proposal um, and our rationale behind that. Um, I will say that I believe that the current ordinance is deeply flawed, and um, we've presented one option that I think improves it. Um, if this council decides not to go with that option, then I think that we would be best served by repealing the current ordinance rather than leaving the current ordinance in place. I think that the option that we have presented is more nuanced, um, it's balanced, provides uh, that essential public protection um, along with uh, giving folks um, some more freedom um, and giving people a clear path to request a variance um, and giving the variance committee clear abilities and authority to grant that variance. Um, so I, I'm happy with the proposal um, after you know the deliberation and the thought that we put into it. Um, but this is an area where reasonable people can disagree. Um, and it is really a public policy decision of how far uh, we want our local government to go in um, you know, prescribing uh, what goes into to, uh, folks' homes. And I understand there's some particular um, uh, public, uh, strong public feeling um, that has been expressed to us in some um, written comments and I assume will be expressed tonight um, regarding where folks feel that should fall and that is um, absolutely welcome and I want us to have an open discussion about that. Um, I do want to address one thing. Um, it's generally the practice of this council to uh, not um, acknowledge or address uh, personal attacks that are made on us. Um, however, I feel in this instance um, that I would like to call this out and acknowledge this. Um, there's been, uh, by one member of the public, um, an implication made that um, Anne and I are somehow naive young women who were, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, bullied into our decision by the fire chief and that we were somehow tricked by the fire chief. Um, because you know we are not smart enough to understand or, or know what's going on here um, and I want to call that out as absolutely absurd um, we are both um, intelligent members of this community who have been elected to give our best judgment here um, so I absolutely want to have a discussion about the merits of this public policy um, but I want to I think that sort of insidious um, thinking and gossiping and um, sending out that sort of thinking is really poisonous and I think the only way to address it is to call it out so that's what I'm doing um, and then I would invite us to have a real conversation about what we want our public policy on this issue to be thank you Rosie. okay so uh, I guess I, I just want to ask maybe Chief Gowans I know we're gonna have a lot of, hear a lot of comment <laughs> I think a lot of this is gonna be focused on the um, inclusion of uh, single and two unit uh, uh, homes and I understand we are the only city in the state that has that requirement. So I think, at least from my view, it would be helpful to hear from you what the rationale is for 
having that obligation on these single and two family homes um, in light of the fact that nobody else in Vermont does that. All right, and it was established in 2003. There was a committee made up, appointed by the council. A lot of effort and work went into that. I was not on that committee. And a decision was made after looking at uh, safety issues and, and homes, uh, single family and two family homes that have uh, sprinkler systems, there's an 80% reduction in fire deaths in homes that have, in homes that have sprinklers, there's a 65% uh, reduction in firefighter injuries. In homes that have sprinkler systems, there's a 70% reduction in damage to the home. So there was a lot of thought and effort went into putting this, op this uh, ordinance in place based on a lot of those issues. There was a discussion um, on if the city were to continue to grow, the city could grow without the fire department growing. The fire department could stay at the size and equipment level they are without, uh, so the city could continue to grow without a growth in the fire department. I don't, no, I yeah, wasn't I mean, involved in that issues, community. I think, um, you know, I was probably more involved in it than, than Bob was uh, at the time. Um, Chief Lewis was here. The city council, as I recall, unanimously approved it at the end of mm -hmm. the, the, the process. Um, there had been a, a residential fire death in the late 90s, and then there was a, the downtown fire shortly after that, the early 2000s, and I think that really felt uh, prompted a need that something needed to be done. The city uh, looked at this and looked at, at basically safety factors and looked at, uh, I think there was a real concern with apartments because of uh, a person could be taking using risky behavior in one part of the unit and the other people are vulnerable without knowing what's going on, whereas if you're building a new addition, that you can protect that. Um, and uh, I think so that was also the reason why the, the tax credit was created, to, to recognize that there was a lessened burden on the fire department for those community, you know, those people that had those, that they could receive tax, uh, a capped tax credit. Uh, and in fact, the city also got very actively involved uh, for a time. There were grants for these sorts of things. There aren't any more um, in helping some of the downtown commercial buildings to obtain sprinkler systems to, to prevent a catastrophic loss in the downtown, but also loss of life. I think the a compelling factor uh, was, and it's even since this ordinance has been another one, was that the only fatalities in Montpelier, fire fatalities in the last 40 years, had been in single family residential homes, or two, one or two families residentials, not in commercials, not in apartment buildings. I guess my question about that, though, is this ordinance wouldn't affect that. The existing would, ones, no, that's, that's right. That's what I'm, I mean, not so this ordin but ordinance wouldn't have any impact on these. No. And aren't newer units, I mean, are they, like, for example, required to have wired in I can tell you. building, <laughs> uh, wired in uh, smoke detectors? It just seems to me new units, the, the only units, there's an anomaly in this, it seems to me, that you've got older units that are going to be less safe and unaffected by the ordinance, and new units that are going to be more safely built that have, for example, wired in smoke detectors that would be affected. So not it, necessarily. That's what I'm trying to understand. Not necessarily, because newer construction is, is of a lightweight construction. It burns quicker, collapses sooner. Um, I, I, I uh, got all that information out to the council from the NFBA. In addition to that, it's more um, the furnishings. The furnishings of a home are, are made of a lot of polycarbonates. Things burn more rapidly. Flashovers happen more quickly. Um, temperatures rise quicker in homes now than they did 20 years ago and because of what furnishings are made of. Yeah, I think, so the, 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 and at the time, the, the ordinance was put in, um, council certainly recognized it, that the cost and the effort involved in retrofitting every home in Montpelier was, you know, not at all feasible or anything you could even consider, but that, it, you know, we, if going forward we could protect the community and people, uh, that was, I think, the, the intended desire. We did take a look at, uh, at the time, and again, so I get, at the outset, I'd say if we're going to seriously consider relooking at this, I would ask that we, you know, we've had a committee look at it and reach a conclusion that we spend some time because a lot of work was done by the council, uh, getting a lot of information. We looked at videos of fires with sprinklers and without them, and even in smoke alarms, you still have to be able to get out. I mean, you're still, that, that's not, a, if you're upstairs and there's the, 
the gases and those kind of things. And just because you know the alarm's going on doesn't mean that you're going to escape successfully. So, that, you know, yes, it's better than having no smoke alarm, but it's not as safe as a sprinkler. And so I think, you know, I, I, I just urge that you've had my suggestion. You've had a committee that put a lot of work in it, gave you a recommendation that our chief and I will fully support. And well, I appreciate just all the work. The I smoke, just I, the smoke alarm because I've heard that smoke, smoke alarms are better. The NFPA's reports will tell you that on, on smoke alarms in a single family or multifamily home will reduce fire deaths by 50%, where sprinkler systems would reduce deaths by 80%. Yeah, and I, I wasn't suggest, suggesting they're better, and I, uh, but I guess my concern, I understand all the work that's gone into it. I'm not saying we're going to you know, make a dramatic decision here, but I'm just look at this and say we are the only city in my If we were facing this dire public health, threat, uh, we would not be the only community in the state that had this ordinance. And that's kind of the full lens that I see this. But, uh, well, and so a couple of things. I, I read Barbara's uh, response as well, and I'd actually kind of be interested in having her come up as well, since she sort of advocated for a different position than, um, than the committee did. And I would like to hear that perspective, because I've heard from a number of folks uh, who are architects and who are contractors who are involved in potential new projects, and, and I think that's a really important perspective to hear, and I understand how much work the city has put into this, but I think it's important that we have a robust discussion um, given given what's at stake here. Um, so I, I would like to invite Barbara. Sure. Up. So we have a, a number of members of the public. I know the oh, Planning no, Commission. The Planning Commission uh, considered this, and so would like, I know there are a lot of people here from the public, so including Barbara and, and, and Kirby, so however you guys want to proceed, but we're interested in hearing from anybody who's here wants to comment on this issue. Kirby Keaton, I'm the Vice Chair of the Planning Commission. Uh, so Barb has a lot to say, as uh, Commissioner Hill, or Councilor Hill pointed out. Uh, but first, uh, I thought we'd just kind of set the stage with uh, where I could catch you up on the motion that was passed by the Planning Commission, so that the Planning Commission's official response uh, to the, uh, the committee's work. Um, and I should start off by saying that it seems like it was a lot of great work and that Rosie's memo was wonderful uh, and really well thought out and put together. Uh, but officially, the Planning Commission uh, responded to this with just a motion on, uh, to suggest that you repeal the ordinance instead of, instead of trying to amend it. And for one simple reason, and that being that the Planning Commission has tried to put forward uh, one set of rules whenever possible. That's kind of like, that's kind of what, what the Planning Commission has been trying to do in its recent work with the zoning and other things we've looked at. And currently there's a state building code. And the state building code uh, was passed by the legislature where it was decided that you know, single family and, and these duplexes were going to be left out. And so we'd like for that one set of rules to apply to Montpelier. And as the mayor pointed out, that's what every other town has decided to do. So that was kind of the, the limits of what the Planning Commission vote was about. It was just about having one set of rules. Uh, and then I, I also have a personal statement about, about things, but at this point I could probably hand it off to Barb now that, uh, and then I can. Whichever, now or, I mean, okay. if you want to well, go maybe, ahead. Okay, sir, as long as you're here, maybe go sure, ahead. For efficiency's sake, I'll just say that, uh, and I could, so what I have to say, I could say any week, I think, any given week uh, at, at these meetings. Something comes up that is an obstacle to housing in Montpelier. And we have um, a real problem with, with a shortage of housing in Montpelier. And um, I think that every week it seems like something comes up that, uh, this, that could be an obstacle to doing something about that problem. And the market shows us that there's uh, an incredible demand for housing in Montpelier. And there's almost no supply. And economics tells us that doesn't happen unless we put up some really serious barriers to, to having the market respond. Not, and, and since the market's not responding, I think we see that we have, that, we, that we've, it's been, you know, um, this, the city has, has done something there. And I think it's, it's, there's dozens of roadblocks and that this ordinance is one of those things um, that gets in the way of, of, of housing. Um, I don't need to tell you all of the things we're missing out on because we have this housing problem. Uh, you know, if we solve the housing problem, we would have uh, fewer reliance on automobiles. We would have fewer, uh, less forest fragmentation elsewhere in the region. Uh, our 
property taxes would be lower, the economic advantages, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think you, you all know all about all those things. So to me, it's not just housing. It's not just a one issue thing. It's a holistic big issue thing. Uh, and one thing I'd like to get across, and hopefully I won't be coming back and doing a speech like this again. So hopefully it's just a one time thing for many, many, many different things, sprinklers and many things. And it's that we have to say no to these barriers to housing more often, much more often than we say yes if we're actually going to be serious and do something about the housing problem. And that's, that's my own personal statement. Uh, the Planning Commission did not have anything to do with that. Okay. Well, well said. Thank you, Kirby. Thanks. Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Hill. Um, I have copies of what I sent to the council. If you don't. Your, the microphone. Yeah. I realize it was late in the afternoon today. I got it. You got it. I got it. I got it as well, actually. Yes, I got a copy as well. Sure. I'll Fails. take a copy short. Thank you. Chief Gowans. Oh, look. Yeah, I've yes. seen it. Yeah. This is kind of a modification of what we've talked about in the past. Um, first of all, I really want to commend the committee. I attended uh, as many of the meetings as I could. And there was a lot of work and a lot of good thought that went into the, that whole thing. <clears throat> and um, all but particularly commending emergency services. I mean, the fact that we have so few fires in Montpelier is really a um, direct result of, of our excellent services here. So I don't want this to be reflective of that at all. Um, I do um, <coughs> want to address a few of the issues that were raised um, in uh, Councillor Kruger's uh, memo that, um, well, some of them surprised me a bit. Um, she mentioned the, um, that three different options were considered. One, to repeal the ordinance completely. The second was to create a fire protection district in the downtown core. And that has been discussed in the past, and it wasn't clear to me why that was not pursued because if our concern is really about fire protection for the downtown district um, that that would create the opportunity to in some cases perhaps put some additional requirements in for commercial buildings in the downtown <clears throat> and then the third option was to keep the ordinance but exempt one and two family homes um, I, the, the discussion about foam furnishings is certainly an issue, um, but I think that that would, as, as Mayor Holler pointed out, that happens in existing homes too. And so I don't think that by adding sprinklers to new construction, which admittedly is going to be a very small percentage of the homes that are occupied in Montpelier are going to be new construction. Um, but I just wonder if we're asking the right questions. Are we looking at the right threats and dangers to the city? Um, I was sort of disappointed to see in the budget that there was a line item for um, rental inspections, but that it wasn't funded. Because I can certainly see that if we had the opportunity to have existing rental units inspected, um, to my mind, that's where a lot of the fire um, potential fire problems occur. Um, I also think as, it, as we went through this, um, I had some different interpretation about the codes regarding change of use, but I won't get into that right now. It's something more that should maybe be cons discussed with, with uh, building code officials to see what, what's, where's the clarity here. Um, certainly some of the requirements um, I applaud for exempting duplexes or uh, accessory units. That makes it very clear for us to be able to implement the zoning um, attempt to create more housing by allowing people in large houses to duplex. That's, that's definitely a benefit. Um, but the other thing that became clear to me is, as I attended the committee meetings and also in, in looking at this later, was that if we modify state codes without a clear knowledge of what we're doing, um, we potentially get the city into a very serious situation. Um, in the current 
current ordinance um, is, is fairly narrowly written, um, so perhaps it hasn't created any consequences yet. But I think that the p possibility of creating unintended consequences when we take a national code and this, that the state has adopted, a number of national codes that the state has adopted, and tweak them without necessarily knowing how that impacts other aspects of the code, I think can be a problem. For example, one of the things I, I was kind of horrified to discover um, in the, one of the national codes is that if we sprinkler one and two family homes, then we are not required to put in egress windows in bedrooms any longer. Well, I think that's a little bit confusing because we have, Montpelier has adopted the 2003 IRC um, and so we have a building code that requires that and it doesn't, it wouldn't allow for um, there to be that exemption if it's sprinklered. So no, it's in, it's in one of the other codes. It's in NFPA 101. In the section of NFPA 101 that addresses one and two family homes, uh, when, when it says if it's sprinklered, then it's not required. Right. We have, we also have IRC, the 2003 IRC and so that there's a, another piece of city ordinance that is requiring. Well, and that's what, what the building, Chris Lumber, our building inspector, when he reviews those, he, he looks at all of the, and I think that's addressed early on in, in the. I just think that it's, it's you know, it can create a, a lot of unintended consequences when we sort of pick and choose what we, you know, if we wanted to do this, if we wanted, I, what my recommendation was actually was to um, the city council was to suspend the current um, uh, sprinkler ordinance and to sit down with code officials, people who from the state and if necessary federal um, people who are involved in writing the codes and so that we know exactly what the ramifications are of any of these actions that we take. And we may still decide to take them. I would hope not in terms of one and two family homes, but um, at least, you know, in terms of your other concerns about change of use, you know, those are, those are happening in our city. And we, you know, maybe we need to be able to clarify that. But to just do that without looking at it more comprehensively is disturbing to me. I just want to make one clarification there. Um, we are not changing the state code. We are applying additional requirements on top of the state code. Um, so there, we're not going in and editing the state code. This is an addition to what's in the state code. But you're modifying the state code as it's been adopted by, uh, by the state uh, fire. We're being more restrictive, yes. Well, but that is modifying it because you're adding requirements to it that, that on statewide are not there. But aren't that, are isn't that true in the zoning ordinance too? Aren't there occasions when we were stricter, say on, uh, we talked about the vernal pools and other areas that exceeded state law that were unique to Montpelier and not consistent? I mean, isn't that something Actually, that Actually, I think, do? think that was, are you still, yeah. yeah um, I think that was what Kirby was addressing is that we pulled back from any, adding any additional requirements that were Montpelier only. There's nothing in the new zoning that's different from state? that exceeds the state requirements. I, I think, yeah, I think your, your point is correct, that there's, there are things in the zoning that, that's unique to Montpelier, but we're trying to, in places where there's already a, a code on a, on a subject, the, the planning commission is trying to keep it so that there's one set of rules to make it simpler. Yeah, I'm just, I, I'm not trying to catch anybody. I just, I seem to recall there were places where the state set a limit and we, we adopted stricter standards. I think Kirby's, uh, Kirby's point is there's a code, there's a building code uh, that is. Can I just make a point on that? The state the is very supportive of our ordinance. And we, we have a contract with the state. The state has signed a contract with the city of Montpelier to do inspections and they're very supportive of our ordinance. Okay, thank you. Um, do you want to hear? Uh, Okay, Ben, did you have a comment? Yeah, um, Ben Eastwood, uh, Main, Main Street. Um, I, I just want to say, as a, as a citizen here in town, I'm appalled to hear people putting more development or cheaper development ahead of safety of firefighters and of people. The numbers are clear. I'm a former EMT. From a, I used to run with Brandon Vermont. I've responded as an EMT to fire calls, and I've seen 
what happens in, in, and I've, I've, I've treated firefighters who were injured on, on a scene. And the fact that we're, 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 we're putting uh, easy development ahead of public safety and ahead of firefighter safety is appalling to me. I think that, that we, we need to set a strong safety standard for our city. And uh, furthermore, um, you know, Mr. Mayor, um, you seem opposed to this idea in your, in your speaking, but you are, are, are you not a lobbyist for the insurance agency in industry and for the real estate valuation? And, you know, aren't real estate developers financially impacted by this potential? Um, you know, is there a conflict of interest in your lobbying work with your ability to participate in this uh, conversation? No, I, Ben, I don't, can't think of any client that I have that could care. I mean, has no interest at all in this. Real this Estate really Valuation good. Association doesn't care about, about I don't business. represent them, that, Ben. And according and to the Secretary of State's right, no, uh, I'm not, the website, no. you do. Right, no, I don't. Okay. So the website, so the Secretary of State's website that's is mostly. That's not current, that's right, right, not current, right. All right, well, that's just what it says on our, our website. Right, I understand. It's not current. And, and, that, and you don't represent the insurance, the insurance industry at all? I do represent insurance entities. I don't think they would have any position one way or another on this. Uh, it seems, seems like it seems like you know those things would would, would call into play, and you know you know you, you also represent Fairpoint, which would be a potential um, opponent or competitor to the in, the in, internet uh, discussion earlier. And I was happy to see that you didn't take any position on that. But you know I do I just think that. Public safety and firefighter safety is something that we can't nickel and dime. This is something that has been discussed through the city council, as, as Bill, as Bill has, has said here, unanimous, unanimously supported this idea of, of, of improving public safety. And to see people putting further development ahead of firefighters is just appalling to me. That's all. Yes. I'd just briefly like to respond to Mr. Eastwood's comments about safety. I don't speak for the whole council, but I don't think that we're anyone's debating that having sprinklers in buildings makes them more safe. I think we all agree on that. And, and if you look at other more stringent code, for example, in high-rise apartment buildings, uh, open flames are prohibited. So people in cities can't have gas stoves in buildings over a certain height. Uh, there is increasing a level of strictness around building code to keep people safe. We're in favor of that. What we're trying to do here tonight is to, I think, is to, is to find a balance. And I respect the chief's position on this immensely. He, his position should always be in favor of greater public safety. 80%, 80%. Ben, we're not gonna, I'm sorry, we're not gonna have a public debate. If you wanna take, if you wanna come, if you wanna come back up and make a comment, you can, but not, I just, we're not gonna have, you're gonna get called on like anybody else, so. Wait until Mr. Turcott finishes, and then if you'd like to make a comment, but we're going to do it in order okay, to, as well. So. so I hope that uh, tonight we're really thinking, uh, as Mr. Keaton was saying, more holistically about how this particular ordinance may be affecting, uh, from my perspective, uh, specifically the development environment here in the city of Montpelier. We know that for a long time, even before this ordinance, the population here in Montpelier has been quite stable. We also know that there is much more demand for housing right now than there is supply. I see the changes in this revised ordinance as a step in the right direction. Um, I also see our new zoning that we recently adopted as a big step in the right direction in terms of addressing city council goal of pro providing a variety of housing. Um, you know, applying this to single and, and, and two family homes is really kind of uh, targeting the middle class here. Subsidized housing is going to do the development uh, and in install sprinklers uh, with taxpayer money regardless. People who have the money don't really care, 10 or 20 or 30,000, however much more they're gonna spend on a sprinkler system and the maintenance and the testing. Um, there's also nothing stopping uh, any resident from independently installing a sprinkler system uh, in any new construction that they built. I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned about the mandate to do that and how that may be affecting uh, the palatability of the development environment here in Montpelier. And in speaking to developers, it definitely is one of a variety of issues that are part of the reason that we are not seeing uh, as much new construction as this council uh, would like to see. Um, on the flip side of this, I, I could acknowledge that for any existing homeowner or property owner in Montpelier, 
having more restrictive building code will help to maintain and increase their property value because we know we have demand here and uh, that will also help the roughly 50 percent of residents who need to turn over their house in the next 15 years as they are uh, changing their lifestyle as they age to get a fair market value for that house so that will help to keep up property prices here in Montpelier because it's an additional cost you can add that right onto the sale price of your home if it's a requirement of new building because you can't go and buy that house without it um, those are my thoughts on this matter okay do you have another comment yeah, I, I just want to again say 80 percent and the fact is that the redu reduction in in the potential for death and serious injury the reduction of property damage will will actually have another consequence of reducing insurance costs you know this is something you know this is not necessarily something that is a, you know going to be a huge an enormous burden it's going to affect new housing to bring new housing up into the 21st century i can't understand why we're so afraid to take the lead in this town we're going why do we have to wait for everybody else to do it before we finally take a proactive approach to something as important as safety the safety of our firefighters the safety of our kids and and, and families in this town and 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 uh, you know i'm just uh, i'm quite frankly i'm appalled thank you jim uh, good evening, Jim Libby. Uh, I live on Re Liberty Street, and uh, the first thing I want to say is I'm the person that had the conversation with Councillor Kruger that she characterized pretty well. Uh, I've had to do this a couple times in my professional career, and it's uh, not pleasant. Um, and I've already apologized to uh, Councillor Watson, although the person, the entity in her house that had to deal with my uh, I, I told her I was using my outside voice, but uh, it was her answering machine, so that wasn't as um, difficult or uh, disrespectful, I think, uh, to the conversation that Rosie and I had. Um, so, you know, all that I can say is I apologize uh, to the council for th that. Um, I, w I got on this um, very inappropriate line of argument, and I can certainly, un I think, you know, what, Ann, uh, what Rosie said is an accurate interpretation of what I said. And um, what I realized after I had those conversations was that I was, it was inappropriate, I, it, was, it was inaccurate. I had no reason, there was no basis in fact for me to think uh, what Rosie heard from me. And I, I said it, you know, I'm not denying that. And what I was, and so, what happened between yesterday and today, and uh, Councilor Hill may have seen an earlier draft of my comments, and so my comments between yesterday and today sort of uh, went around 180 degrees, because once I got off that sort of disrespectful, conspiratorial, you can, I don't know, attach any, any um, name that fits, it wasn't appropriate. Um, you know, I quickly realized um, <clears throat> early this morning and then had some feedback from Jack, Jack McCullough and uh, Polly Nickel, who uh, I rely on a lot, and I, I, I should have listened to them before I had the conversation with Rosie. But So, uh, you know, Councilor Kruger and I will have to figure out how we repair whatever damage has been done. I hope that um, I can help do that. So let me just say three things. Um, so I'm pretty happy with the comments that I submitted today. And there was a lot of input from Jack McCullough and Polly, although the housing task force didn't have an opportunity to uh, talk about it. So it's, those are really my, um, those are my comments. Uh, what I was trying to say about the process was it, is that it looked to me as if neither the council nor the committee had a real opportunity to step back and ask the big question, you know, should we have this ordinance? And I thought that was, I suspected that that might have been lacking in the committee process because it was, it's appropriately dominated by the fire safety conversations that um, the chief and the building inspector brought to it. And, and I really appreciated the, uh, um, the memo that Rosie put together. It contained a lot of good information and good thought. Um, you know, generally, I think that the best way to do this, and I think other states have done it this way, I can't tell you how many, is that the state 
one way or another send, passes a law that expressly enables municipalities or counties to do this. I suspect that it's, it may be accompanied by uh, general fund revenue or bonds or however things are funded in other states because, you know, this is one of those unfunded mandates that, you know, all of us once in a while have had a problem with. And I think that's, uh, that's not a, you know, that's a problem. And I think it's a problem particularly in the housing area, particularly because um, we want to, the city I think can and should be more welcoming to, uh, uh, to um, builders. And the, tr the city can be very proud of the track record that we've done over the last 20 years and you know, supporting all these very important projects. You know, I think we have a, you know, the great track record with the Housing Trust Fund. Um, I think it's important to, uh, from time to time, and now is a good time, assess the effectiveness of how trust fund monies have been used. And I think the Housing Task Force is, um, you know, intended to do that. Um, let me see if there's, uh, you know, I pretty much covered the bases in my, uh, in my written comments. Um, let's see if there's anything I'd like to add. Um, the final point is I think, you know, I sense, and this is appropriate, I, I sense two things. One, the council is usually quite deferential to its professionals, including its fire prevention professionals. And I have no comment on our fire prevention professionals, and I actually have no comment on the effectiveness of this ordinance or amended ordinance on improving fire protection. It will. You know, whatever you do, it's going to get better, if only in one or two or three houses. So I was encouraging, well, I didn't do this well yesterday, maybe I did a little better today, encouraging um, you all to have that conversation, you know, which is stepping back. Uh, the other thing that I sense is that it's um, uh, local officials, and I've, I, I know you guys better than anybody else. I don't know you personally, but I know your predecessors, and Bill's been around forever too, so he's a familiar face. But there is a reluctance to repeal things. You know, it's as if there has to be, uh, you know, some huge cataclysmic event. Uh, instead of uh, what you might consider is to say, this wasn't a good idea. If it was a good idea, it isn't working out real well. And, you know, I had mixed feelings. I was really appreciative of Rosie describing the variance process. That's not something to be proud of. You know, in some places, people would be fired for that uh, disregard of the law. I don't think that people were harmed. That's the good thing. And, uh, so in addition to the other issues that have been mentioned, I think there's a time when you just say, we tried this, you know, when, when it was Mary Hooper and the former uh, fire chief, maybe even the same building inspector, I wasn't directly involved. Those people were very committed to fire safety. Mary was the former commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry, and I think she was instrumental in getting the state code to cover multifamily buildings. I'm not sure of that. I, 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 stand, I don't know that. but. I know she was very committed to it, and she would have been very committed to, uh, to this ordinance. She was, and the council adopted it. Um, I just think it didn't work out as planned, um, and uh, it's unfair. Um, it, it, it does provide uh, additional fire safety uh, in the small number of units that are newly constructed, but I'm not sure that's the right place to uh, have mandates. Um, but the only other point I would make um, is that, and compare it to how the state and the municipalities have handled affordable housing. You know, in the 80s, there was, there was a tremendous uh, leap forward on affordable housing. It's been a huge problem. With the, you know, one part of it was the creation of the Housing and Conservation Board. At the same time, the legislature created a dedicated fund uh, in the second year of its existence, appropriate an additional 20 million in addition to the dedicated fund, and has has since 1988 appropriated be 10 and, between 10 and 20 million annually, and then last year there was a 35 million dollar state housing bond. So that's a situation where the legislature said, "We want affordable housing. We want it to be delivered by a nonprofit delivery system." And here's how we're going to help you. And you see the 
accomplishments. And that's not a feature of this ordinance. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's, maybe it's time to start over. You know, it, it isn't a stellar track record. And that is no reflection on our fire protection professionals. I don't know why the variant stuff was so screwed up. I don't know that whether it was like uh, jury nullification. John probably knows what that is. Kind of a jury really wants to reach a right, a right result, and they don't care what the law is, and they just vote to the right result. And the lawyers and the judges are scratching their heads. I don't think there was any conscious effort, but it kind of feels like that ordinance isn't working out real well if, there's, if there was that much uh, activity around variances. So, uh, so I apologize again. You know, I, I made some significant errors yesterday, and I'll live with that and hope we can move on. So. Okay. Have any questions? Thank you for your comments, Jim. Appreciate it. Okay. What, one minor factual uh, matter. Chuck Caparis was the mayor in 03 when it was passed. No. Oh, he was. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. Hi. Gene Troya. Um, I'm not a Montpelier resident, but am a Montpelier taxpayer and have been for 35 years. Um, I have probably caused more of these sprinkler systems to be installed in single-family houses than anyone else in town. I'm a local building contractor, have been for 35 years, um, and uh, I almost don't know where to start. Um, I think that the idea that houses constructed since 1982 are somehow more fire uh, burn faster um, than houses built in 191850 um, is misguided. Um, there are some issues with houses that have been built with plate trusses. Um, which can, in a fire, come off and cause collapse. And, and I understand the fire department's reticence in, in, in the, the integrity of those buildings in a fire. But to have a ordinance that requires a sprinkler in a single family house I think is ridiculous. Um, I have put 15,000 gallon underground storage tanks to support sprinkler systems. I have put 1,500 in-house storage tanks to support sprinkler systems in single family residences. Um, and the cost is not you guys just you you don't understand the cost involved that you're putting on middle class residents that you want to draw into town. Um, if you want single family house development, I live in East Montpelier. I'm on the select board in East Montpelier. I've been involved in town government for 30 plus years. Um, I can build a house on County Road in Montpelier. I can go on the other side of the road in East Montpelier and build the same house for almost $30,000 less. Um, if you're going to go and amend the ordinance and exempt 1,200 square foot houses, small houses, if you're going to exempt manufactured homes, what are you doing? Uh, you're, you're making social choices through a building ordinances. And, and I don't think that's quite right. Um, I, I question, as the ordinance stands, what happens with manufactured ho homes in town now. I mean, I'm proud of what I've done in Montpelier. And I've built a significant number of the single family houses that have happened in this town since 1982. Uh, that I know about this meeting on 
two and a half hours notice from a friend of mine uh, that I didn't know at all about the committee and had a chance to talk to the committee, I think is um, a miscommunication on the part of the government of the town and how people are notified of, of the way this happens. Um, I, th I think it's ridiculous that I can own a single family house, and I own a couple of them in town that have sprinkler systems in them, and I can ho own a multifamily house built in 1843 or 7 or whatever it is, and not have a sprinkler system in it. I, I, I mean, you're putting the public safety issue bass backwards. Um, that I can go into a restaurant on Main Street and be in a building without a sprinkler system, but I have to have one in a single family house. Uh, you're putting the cart before the horse. Um, and that's just the way I feel. Um, I'm proud right, I'm going to ask I you to wrap up if you could. We've got a number of other people we need to hear from. Appreciate your comments. Like, don't, I don't want to, I mean, feel free to finish up, but just ask you to wrap up your comments if you could. I understand you don't want to hear about the people that actually build houses in your town. No, I do want to hear from you, and we have, and I appreciate that. We just, it's almost 9 o'clock, and we have a lot to go through, and more people we need to hear from. So we just don't have an unlimited amount of time. That's my only point. Okay. Uh, my, my point is, if you're about public safety, look at public buildings. If you're looking at single-family houses, which is a small part of the equation. Um, if you're looking at promoting development in town and drawing middle-class people to town, look at what you're doing in cost to building single-family houses. Thanks for your comments. Uh, Justin. Mr. Mayor, I just have a quick follow-up question for this gentleman. Um, as a veteran um, right here, as a veteran builder and contractor, I'm curious for your professional opinion, um, does having a sprinkler ordinance for single and two-family homes in Montpelier uh, in any way change your um, interest or willingness to develop here in the city of Montpelier? Um, my interest in developing in the city of Montpelier is it's so hard to do, your property values are like gold. It's like having a house in uh, St. Petersburg or Providence, um, Provincetown, I mean. Um, it, it's a niche market. Um, the values are really high, and they will stay that way as long as you discourage development. So if I'm hearing you correctly, having this sort of restrictive ordinance actually helps to increase in, in, in our property Absolutely. values. Absolutely. From your it, perspective. From my perspective, if it costs $20,000 more to build the house in Montpelier than it does in East Montpelier or Berlin, it increases your property values. That's just my perspective. Thank you. Okay. Other comments? Oh, yeah. I just... I, I, did a little cursory research. It doesn't appear like Burlington, and I know that we're not Burlington, not saying that we are Burlington, but Burlington has been tackling the affordable housing issue for for as long as we have, but I think they've been somewhat more successful. Um, I also just took a glance to see, uh, it looks like the Massachusetts legislature enacted a law, I want to say in the 90s, and the Mass Supreme Court took up an issue about, uh, it looks like the Mass law targeted four plus unit uh, buildings. So, uh, you know, I, I think I think that I, I've heard a lot about single family and duplex, um, you know, and, and and I'm not sure what the answer is, whether it's repealing in its entirety, which I hear some compelling arguments for, um, or whether it's to cre create a solution to these particularly articulated scenarios where uh, a building um, 
is designated maybe as commercial retail and then transitions to a dining establishment or something along those lines. Um, but other places don't have ordinances like this and seem to address public safety. They also seem to, um, it's, affordable housing seems to also dovetail into all of this in a way that does not um, co cost an extra 20000 plus dollars on a single family or a, a two unit um, building. And, and I agree that that does price out a lot of folks. Um, and, and I've heard from folks who have, you know, maybe rehabbed places or uh, who have built new construction where that was a huge expense and that really kind of de determined how many units they would build or what they would or wouldn't do. And um, I think as a council, it's incumbent upon us to get this right. Uh, and. Uh, just a quick follow up on that. I'm pretty sure that most affordable housing that's built in Montpelier would already be sprinkled because of the number of units, mm -hmm. and so it's going to be tr it's going to trigger the the state, state or ordinance anyway. Um, so that's one thing. Um, just one thing I want to make sure that people understand um, uh, is that the way that this is written um, under the variance section, there is a provision um, that uh, things that will be considered in granting variances includes unreasonable cost burden. So if that is, uh, you know, if it's going to cost something like $10,000 or more, um, I'm, I'm not sure that we can say for sure that that will be granted, but that's, that it'll be granted a waiver, but that is certainly one of the things that the variance committee can, can weigh. Um, so as, um, you know, as people are, are worried about construction, I mean, this is a very different thing um, than what we're dealing with now. So just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. I would like to respond to that. It costs more than $10,000 to sprinkle a single family house. So I have multiple friends who have done this and it's cost them about $10,000. They've gotten bids for more um, and that's fine. But w that's what we're saying is that if that the cost is a factor and that that's built into this ordinance. Why don't you just make it for multifamily properties and exempt single family houses or exempt single family houses that have more than a specific setback from their neighbor? So the setbacks I mean, are if, part if, of if, this as well. If, if, if you're <coughs> six feet away, I can understand the fire hazard. But if you're on a 0.4 acre lot with a 20 foot setback, why does this become an issue when it, we all know it costs more than $10,000 to sprinkle a single family house? So I would encourage you to. Okay, so I'm going to jump in here. So I, we're going to, at the end of the argument, we can, you, you made your presentation, we appreciate that, but this isn't a forum for having yes, an argument back and forth. <laughs> uh, okay, Tim. Thank you. I'm Tim Heaney. I live on Main Street and I work on Main Street. Wrote up some thoughts and tried to get my mind around this today too, and share Jean's frustration with years of trying to work with this ordinance and create housing. And um, so I'm not going to read all this to you, but forgive me if I read a bit. And I'm going to try to do bullets just to give you my thoughts. I think Rosie's remarks are, were, were really good, and thank you. It helped me get an understanding of what the committee's been doing. Um, I'm just concerned that the recommendations don't improve the functionality of the ordinance that we have today and they do not strategically encourage housing growth in line with our recently uh, adopted zoning and master plan. The ordinance we have has proven to be ineffective. Its focus is on uh, requiring fire suppression sprinkler systems for new structures, including single family homes. And as it's been said tonight, I think single family homes are probably a very small part of our housing stock and probably the safest group of homes within the housing stock we have with you know, hardwired smoke and, and carbon dioxide systems, new wiring, new heating systems. They're actually built to code. Most of the homes we have in Montpelier, there was no building code when they were built. Um, I, so I think it really is the wrong focus, as if you've heard over and over tonight. Um, I think probably the focus really needs to be if you want to create a safer living environment for people in Montpelier and you want to improve our older housing stock, you've got to create a way to have this sprinkler ordinance focus on existing multifamily housing. The fire within the last two weeks on the corner of Main and Loomis Street with an eight unit house, I think that property could have benefited uh, if there had been a sprinkler system there. Bob Gowans, I'm sure, can tell me more 
if that if that would have kicked in or not there. But I would love a sprinkler system in every building in the city. Yeah. <laughs> but there, there there has to be you have to draw the line somewhere. And, and I agree. I'd, 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 I'd like to see the line focus more on the older multifamilies and, and trying to find a way to create a code that's not punitive. You know, it's the old carrot and stick thing like the code we have. Let's create an incentive to find a way to help people install these systems and, and all these wonderful old buildings that we have. Uh, there are a lot of neat ways we can do it. You could even be as simple as helping to offset some of the hookup fees with city water lines. Um, anyway, the, uh, I think the committee's recommendation is kind of it is flawed in essence because it's just trying to modify a flawed basic policy I'd love to see the the uh, council uh, take up the Planning Commission's recommendation and repeal the ordinance and have the committee take a fresh look at what can we do to make housing safer in Montpelier hopefully that recommendation will include um, ways to create incentives to put sprinkler systems in uh, our multifamily houses thanks thank you, thank you Tim uh, if, if we're ready, I, I would like to make a motion. Let me just first see if there is anybody else who would like to make a comment before we do, if you don't mind, Jean. No, I don't. Phil, welcome. Good evening. I'm Phil Dodd. Um, I primarily got interested in this from the point of view of a downsizing group I've been involved with. Some of you may be aware of that. We're, we're looking for opportunities for people to move out of their larger homes as they get older and move into smaller ones. Um, so this this will uh, impact uh, that desire. You know, when I first learned about this, I was, I was surprised to learn we're the only city in Vermont that has uh, a sprinkler ordinance applying to single family homes. Um, most of us live in town without sprinklers. Um, you know, there is a balance here and I, I you guys have to figure out where that is. But one thing I think thought about was um, we could make cars a lot safer. We could require $10,000 more in safety equipment or heavier cars and have probably a bigger impact on cutting down deaths. But we, as a society, we've decided not to do that, and we live with uh, the situation we have. So there's that, that cost and, and benefit you really have to weigh here. Um, the thing, uh, I, I went to the last sprinkler ordinance meeting and I had heard that the earlier draft before the one you ended up with excluded, it was an exemption for all single story, single family homes, which was appealing to me because that's what a lot of downsizers would like to have. And I think it, it makes some sense because you can get out the window, you can get out the door if you require enough doors and windows. Um, but then it got pulled back to only houses uh, less than 1,200 square feet. Uh, it also, uh, the exemption does not apply if there's an attached garage or, or no, or it doesn't apply if there's a basement. So it's really become a very limited exemption. And uh, I think, you know, potentially I'd like to see at least to go back to the single story exemption uh, and, you know, maybe require a certain number of doors, one door for every 600 square feet, uh, something like that. Um, but, but, you know, these costs are real, and it's already, building costs are already very high. Uh, so this is, is a real factor for people to consider. Uh, I'm sorry I got here a little late. I, I guess you may have already heard from the Planning Commission about, about what they were saying. I, I do think their views should be given some weight. I happen to have uh, read the statute, Powers and Duties of the Planning Commission. Any Planning Commission created under this chapter, this is from Vermont Statutes, may prepare and present to the legislative body recommended building, plumbing, fire, electrical, housing, and related codes. So they do have a role to play here. And so uh, I'm glad they're here and, and getting a chance to say something. Um, someone told me some figures recently that I can't verify, but they said in the last 20 years, uh, 1,200 single family homes have been built in the U30 towns surrounding us and 100 in Montpelier. I'm actually surprised it's, it's that many as a, as a hundred single family homes. But there is, you know, an issue here. Uh, and, and I think if we want to have more single family homes in Montpelier, there should be some further loosening of this restriction. Um, we made a lot of changes in the, in the zoning recently with the idea that this would increase housing in Montpelier. I, I you know, as I look this, I, I really think this sprinkler ordinance is a bigger barrier to single family homes uh, being built in Montpelier than the zoning ever was. Um, 
so it's a it's uh, an important issue and uh, I'm sure you'll give it uh, serious consideration thank you thank you Phil <coughs> Jesse. My name is Jesse Remick. Um, I'm a District 2 resident here in Montpelier since 2004. Um, I agree with a lot of what I've heard tonight, safety being an important factor as well. Um, I work at an architecture firm, so I have the pleasure of dealing with codes quite a bit, and I do not pretend to know any and all of them, uh, but I do spend a fair amount of time in them. Um, I'm just getting caught up on this issue and I feel it's a very important one. Uh, but in looking at one of the items you know, that the committee was considering, the three options, one of them keeping the ordinance but exempt one and two family homes, one of the main reasons it seemed that that was not taken was perhaps a statement which I, which I would like to have the answer to is the savings that the fire department is seeing by the sprinkler ordinance. And I think it really needs to be singled out of whether that includes only the single family ordinance or the entire ordinance together as a city because I'm not sure that by sprinkling single family homes we'd see that savings and I feel that that is a compelling argument to not consider that I'm not sure that that's the right argument um, and regarding the IRC without having it with me because I never say I know anything about codes without re going back and, and checking you know, I, I'm not sure that the IRC does require a sprinkler system. Not the 2003 version. No. Right. So, but they do require other provisions be made for safety. Yes. You have so to have interconnected um, uh, smoke detectors and uh, egress. Means of egress, be it a door or a large enough size window. Um, so we're in part saying we need to have a sprinkler system and we need to do these other factors as well. So I, it feels like it's a belt and suspenders type system that we're requiring of single family homes. And I'm just not sure that it's the right approach, but I respect everyone's opinion. So. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, briefly, uh, Ben. Very, very. Rather than a belt and suspenders, I think of it as a belt and, as a seat belt and airbag solution. That's all. I just said one quick response to Mr. Rennick's comment about the future buildings, this won't be long. The, the theory didn't discriminate between which type of building, um, whether it was residential or commercial. It was the theory at the time was if the city continues to develop, we won't have to ex expand the size of the fire department because all the, any new building will be sprinklered. So if, for example, we were successful beyond our wildest dreams with housing and we added a thousand new units, um, if, if they were all not sprinkled, uh, which they, you know, realistically some of them would be. But if in, if in theory they weren't, we would probably have to add firefighters to cover those new, um, that, that new supply. So that was the theory. I, I didn't single out one type of building for another. Barbara? Yeah, there's no one else. Um, just to address a couple of things that were said. Um, Ashley mentioned uh, affordable housing, and I started to think about Habitat for Humanity houses, which are single-family houses, and anything that was built under that in Montpelier would require um, sprinklers. Um, and the other thing, too, is just to direct the council to the research um, that I attached to my comments. Um, when I started looking at this two years ago, um, and I went online, this is what popped up, and this was some, some extensive research done by several groups regarding this, the relative safety of um, smoke detectors and sprinklers, and uh, what they said pretty consistently was that in many cases, fires that could still be deadly were too small or too, uh, to activate the sprinklers. So the first line of defense has to be the detectors and the alarms and so people get out of the building now I understand that the sprinklers are much better for saving the property and certainly better for protecting the firefighters and I, I do appreciate that factor that if you're going to go into a building you'd much rather have a building that's that's more structurally sound um, but in terms of protecting the um, the occupants um, it seems like that's not uh, it's not always the case um, and I guess 
yeah, I think I guess I will just leave it at that. I think that that again, I would um, urge us to not write code language on our own, and that we need to be using the experts that know how to write code language if we choose to rewrite this ordinance. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. May I respond to some of the comments? Sure. First to Barbara's. Um, I said it earlier. Sprinklers reduce deaths in single-family homes by 80 percent. Smoke alarms and CO alarms reduce deaths in single-family homes by 50 percent. That's that's the that's the statistics. You can review it through the NFPA. Sprinklers reduce deaths by 80 percent. Uh, on housing barriers, uh, myself. Mike Miller, Chris Lumber, we're meeting all the time with builders, people coming to us, talking to us about projects. We're not hearing that the reason I'm not building in Montpelier is because of sprinkle systems. We're not hearing that. Probably six months ago, we met with a, a builder who was considering a fairly substantial project in Montpelier, and we talked to him about sprinklers, and he said, I'm not worried about sprinklers. I'm worried about the neighbors preventing me from building my project. I'm not worried about sprinklers. I'm worried about the neighbors. This is a gentleman who's interested in doing a very substantial project in Montpelier. So we're not hearing that. We're not hearing. People aren't coming to us and saying, people are coming to us and saying, I can't find a place to build in Montpelier. I have, uh, you know, I have ideas. We, there was a project presented on Sibley Avenue that was prevented. That wasn't prevented by sprinkler systems. We all know what prevented that. So we're not hearing that that it's being prevented. Um, public billings was brought up. We should be paying attention to public billings. We are paying attention to public billings. We are paying attention to our restaurants. That's on our radar. It's one of the things that the, the changes want to address is those areas. So we are looking at that. Um, and then I just want to quickly, um, there's been a couple of comments about the variance committee. And Councilmember Turcott was a member of the Variance Committee. The Variance Committee worked really hard, and they tried to do the right thing. It was sometimes outside of the ordinance, but it was a group of people, volunteers, who were trying really hard to do the right thing, and I don't think we should be criticizing the efforts of the Variance Committee. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Yeah, yes, I sure. No, no problem. I agree with that sentiment perfectly about the Variance Committee. I think putting with, for, with keeping the requirement for single-family homes and thus increasing the avenues to go through and provide a variance is really putting the Variance Board in a tough spot because it's a gray area. And it's because I feel the requirement isn't necessarily the best one. And so we're pro constantly providing ways to help improve a requirement that isn't maybe right. Okay, Jane, did you have a motion you wanted to make? Yes. Um, given all the all the questions and concerns from the folks here and, and from the council and even granted that, that the committee did so so much work, uh, I I move to repeal the current city sprinkler ordinance and replace it with the state fire code until further review. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? And I still have lots of things to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just want people to know that I, I checked in with a couple of friends of mine who are intending to build um, some infill in Montpelier and ran this by them to see if they thought it would work for them, and they they thought it would, so that was uh, encouraging. Um, I am also really glad that a cost provision is a part of the considerations for variances, so that is built into this. Um, there was a question that was brought up, like, is this actually better um, than the current ordinance? And I would say it is definitively better because it, because it is much clearer as to how one is going to, what, how one could go about uh, getting a variance, and it's clear uh, uh, that one could get a variance, which was not clear from the current um, uh, wording. Um, also, you know, as as, a, as we sort of ran through the kinds of buildings that this would affect, one of the one of the things that came up was a potential for cottage clusters, 
And that's the kind of single-family home that would potentially, um, that would be in the balance here, right? Like, are, are we going to require that they be sprinkled or not? And um, under this uh, iteration of the, the proposed uh, amendment, they would be. And if we just repeal it, they would not be. Um, and uh, frankly, I, I've kind of come, I've come to a place where if someone's going to be planning a whole set of uh, units for development, that's something that I would want to have sprinkled. Uh, and so, uh, you know, just uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any other iterations of things that are worth bringing up, but that was certainly one of them. Um, Barbara, you brought up uh, whether or not we should be writing this language in the first place. And I would argue that the same logic also applies to the zoning. Should we be, uh, you know, coming up with language if nobody else does it? And we've actually had this reviewed by a lawyer, not necessarily in depth, but briefly, and he was comfortable with it. Um, and that is comfort enough for me in terms of the, the legal standing of this. Can I address that? Sure. Since you addressed that to me. Um, well, I... Um, Sorry, the first your first point um, being that this this may have been reviewed by a lawyer, but a lawyer is not a building professional. And building professionals that I have spoken with, and other also other people that have to administer, have have serious questions about whether or not it could be administered easily. Um, and, and our oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. From from that standpoint, and I'm sorry, what was your first point? I miss. I had many points. Yeah, many points. All right. Um, but I think, um, oh, the cottage cluster. Um, but recognize that cottage clusters could be individual homeowners. So that individual homeowner with a, a small cottage of 1,400 square feet, which they're allowed in, in cottage cluster, um, then adding in the additional cost of the sprinkler, even when they're not, then when they're far enough away from their neighbor that probably doesn't isn't necessary. To me, that seems burdensome. So just okay. So I would I yeah, I know, I know, I know. Open this up, but that's not. Yeah. Uh, if you need to make another comment, but then let's um, move on. Well, I guess I would just also raise that. Uh, you brought. You also brought up the the rental inspections, and that I would just say, as an advocate for rental inspections, um, that is something that we have put on the back burner, um, and that's a conversation that we've had with the Housing Task Force, and uh, it's a totally, totally separate thing. Ashley. So I'm just curious, the proposal from the committee would send a, a large number of things to the variance committee. I mean, this could potentially be a huge number of things. I mean, I, does the city staff that committee? <laughs> we we participate in it, yeah. Yes. So that's going to cost. That's going to take city resources. I mean, if we're talking, and again, I'm I'm not showing my hand one way or the other on this, but I'm I'm asking from a practical perspective. I mean, what sort of resources is that going to require the city to put forward to address the number of variances that are going to come in if there is, you know, again, it's assuming an inundation of applications but uh, depending on the size of a potential project that could that could happen I mean and, and so I suppose that's one um, that's one question and I guess the my other question is um, I forgot it so I'll stop talking <laughs> so I just wanted to say one thing on that um, I think that the variance committee is already receiving a lot of variance requests they're just outside of what's allowed in the and that makes me extremely uncomfortable, and it's one of the reasons that I raised this, you know, originally. Um, so I don't dispute that there would be an increase, um, but I think there is already, um, you know, there have been quite a number um, since 2013, at least. Okay, Could you reread the the motion? I'm interested in the word. Jean used a word, and it wasn't suspend. And Repeat. one of the comments that other people have made is suspend and then work on. She said repeal. Uh, to repeal the current city sprinkler ordinance and replace it with the state fire code until further review. And I just, I don't think we need to replace it with the state fire code because that would already exist regardless. So I might, you know, if you were willing to amend that, um, that would be more proper. I just do need to repeal the current city sprinkler ordinance until further review. Is that 
the that state your intent? Chief? That is the intent. Okay. Yeah, okay. as long as the state fire code. Okay, so with that objection, we'll consider the amendment okay. revised to reflect that. Other comments, Bill? I'd just say if we're good, if you're going to talk about now, obviously we still have to have a second reading. So, mm -hmm. um, but if you think about repeal, just make sure that we're talking about everything. You know, if, if there are whether it's one or two part, you know, sections of the ordinance, the single and one and two family pieces, if that's what you're really interested in, then we ought to talk about that. I mean, obviously, it's your policy decision, uh, but make sure when we, you know, the ordinance also talks about commercial buildings, restaurants with apartments up, you know, the, so if you throw the whole thing out, you know, make sure we, we, that's a thoughtful decision. Uh, secondly, um, I would urge the council um, to, if, you know, this was a, an ordinance that was enacted with a lot of input um, from professionals, building professionals, fire professionals, fire safety professionals. You've heard opinions from a lot of people. I know the Planning Commission offered their opinion. I'm not aware that they did full testimony with people at differing points of view that they, um, so, you know, I think I'd urge us to be deliberate and thoughtful about making it and make sure you've had an opportunity to hear from a lot of different points of view with more facts. Um, before you make a rash decision. This is a question for John Odom. John, what is the procedure by which one could move to table something given that there's a motion on the floor? Uh, once there's a motion on the floor, it, it takes precedence. It over it. So we'd have to so we'd have it. it and we'd get it. I think we'll have a vote. I mean, that's the way to deal with the resolution is to, or a motion is to have there a vote. Can, there can be a motion to amend the, the motion and there can be, the, the motion can be withdrawn, but the motion is a prior, takes prime. Oh, okay. Well, I just, let me just ask a question for Bob because I think this is relevant I, to and this I discussion. And I want to comment to make is, also. Uh, how does the state fire code deal with multifamily buildings and downtown? Over three units. <laughs> Anything, or three units or more. Would be required to be except, sprinkled. Except. Yes. That, um, Buildings under four story, no, that, that buildings with um, a direct protected um, access, uh, I think dedicated access to yes. each unit yes. um, are exempt. So if you have like a kind of a lower um, single or a lower um, multifamily building and every unit has oh, a door okay. to the outside no. or a protected hallway to the outside, then you're not required. And how about state code. commercial buildings? As far as Spring, required to be sprinkled under uh, the state building code. The state controls commercial buildings. New. Yeah. No, uh, what my question is, what is the I understand the state new code? have to be sprinkled, but yes. the change of use, we, we, our ordinance also includes a change of use provision, so if something. Where the state would not. Right. Correct. Right. Uh, an ex a perfect example would be the, because we talk, I talk about it all the time, the Bohemian Bakery. Yep. Under the state, that they would not have required that. State. Can I and I did, can I just say one more thing? Yes, yeah, sure. I would encourage people, however you act, but between now and the next time you get together, to please take a look at the federal tax reform, because in the federal tax reform, and D D Division of Fire Safety, Mike DeRosha assured me he would get something out within the next week. There was heavy lobbying done before that from the International Association of Fire Chiefs, International Association of Firefighters, the NFPA, and in the federal tax reform. There is a provision for sprinklers in single-family homes, 100% write-off of those, until the year 2022. And then at the year 2023, it drops to 80%, and then it incrementally comes down. So um, if you want, I think I sent it to some folks. I can send it to the entire council. And Mike DeRosha from the Division of Fire Safety assured me today that the state would speak to that within the next week because that is in the federal tax reform. Can I just make a correction to you? I actually was mistaken. You can, with, you can move to postpone a motion within the discussion of the motion. Uh, and it's typically done either to another date certain or, you know, if, if someone wants to table something indefinitely, they can be motion to postpone indefinitely. So that's my mistake. There. I would move then, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I would move then that we table this until our next meeting. I didn't I did not read this as a we are going to vote definitively one way or the other tonight. I had thought that this would be an opportunity for council to discuss, hear from people, and then sort of make an informed decision 
um, and I and I have heard a lot of feedback about this. And um, but I would like an opportunity to do some research of my own, and and that's not to undercut anything that anyone has shared with us. I just I I think at this point it makes sense to table it and take it up at our next meeting. Second. So, Discussion, uh, Rosie. I just want to say that this is the first reading of the ordinance. Um, we don't have to do anything tonight, other than conclude the first reading. Um, if we want to conclude the first reading, and then we need to have a second reading, which was on the agenda for next time. I do think that there is, we need to act with some deliberate speed here, um, simply because this does really impact how folks are going to conduct their building projects um, this summer and whether or not they need to get permits, whether they need to design a system, et cetera. So I'm happy to not vote or decide anything tonight, but I would like to conclude the first reading so that you know, when folks go back and think about what they want to do, we can um, have more discussion next time and then come to a conclusion one way or the other. I want to make it really clear for folks who are building this summer what we want them to do um, at the next meeting. It seems to me that these are not mutually exclusive things. Um, I mean, if we vote in favor of postponing uh, this particular motion, that's something that, that could be taken up later and we could finish first reading tonight. Okay, so we have a pending motion. It's been seconded. Is there any further discussion? On favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so this matter will be postponed. I don't need, we don't need to so really take any action on the first So you're concluding first someone reading. wants to move to conclude first reading then? So Was there, does that require a vote on the well, first reading? Well, it might be just reading. procedurally with a pending on a table motion. You might want to just, for the record, be clear that you're closing first reading and or you could declare it I'm closed. not sure we, that is, well, I know what Rose, well, anyway, what, I guess the question is what the council want to do. Uh, Justin. I just wanted to get clarity on the date specific. I know you said next meeting, and so I just wanted to have February a date 14. associated with that. February 14th. Okay, so our plan is to take it up at our next meeting on the 14th. Second reading. Second reading. Is there any, any objection to that plan? Did you want a motion? I don't think we need to. Let's I, I would move that we conclude the first reading. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay, so we will move on. Thanks, everybody, for your uh, uh, input on this. Next slide. I think it's going to be very quick is the, the uh, farmer's market. This is a request for the farmer's market to go to the uh, – uh, to move to the um, – State Street? Yes. Oh, you guys are here. All right. Sorry you had to sit through. Uh, okay. It was just that the was nature of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> and I do hope I'm right that this will be quick. I don't think we're going to have a Absolutely. lot of controversy over this one, I hope. Absolutely. So. We have to sprinkle all their booths, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, we exempted tents. <laughs> we exempted tents. Okay, welcome. All set? Yeah, if you could okay. introduce yourselves. Absolutely. So uh, my name is Karen Wiseman. I'm the president of the board of the Capital City Farmers Market. And I've got here with me Ashton Carroll. Ashton Carroll, manager of the Farmers Market. And one of our law Alan time. Page, um, vice president and 42-year uh, veteran of Farmers <laughs> Markets. Okay, well, we're happy to have you here. <laughs> um, we appreciate your time, and we really will be quick. Um, I'm speaking tonight on behalf of our 68 member vendors um, that our, bus our businesses voted at our annual meeting to make this proposal to the city. Our proposal tonight is to move the Capital City Mar Farmers Market onto State Street between Elm and Main Streets for the entirety of our 2018 outdoor season, which is May to October, 26 weekends. Um, as we've even heard tonight, there's a lot of upcoming construction all over our city. And um, we're pretty sure that we'll be uh, likely be adversely impacted in some way by having a lot of construction all around us. Secondly, we've always been on the lookout for a new permanent home that really can reflect um, city and the community and the farmer's market. 
Um, and so we're hoping that this will be the next step in that evolution of, of finding that right home for us. Our proposal right now is based on a set of successful trial markets that we did um, in September and October of 2017. We teamed up with Montpelier Alive, the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and the city, and uh, we really think it was a great success. It had the look and the feel, and it just it looked great right in downtown. We have metrics associated with the look and the feel, though. Um, we did a set of customer feedback surveys. We typically get over uh, an average of about 2,000 customers every Saturday at the market. And during the first market, we were able to survey 335 customers. Uh, interestingly, 60% of those customers were from Montpelier, 20% were from surrounding towns, and 20% were visiting our city. Um, when we asked them if they thought that the location and the look and the feel was better, 70% said back yes, absolutely. 15% were neutral and 15% and said no, they didn't really like the change. Sales for us, we had the highest grossing market that we've had in five years of the market. Um, additionally, we saw 20 to 30 percent increase in gross sales as compared to our whole average of 2017 markets as well as a history of the f last four years of our market. So really, financially, it, was, it made a big impact. Um, we have support from the Montpelier Downtown Business Association, Montpelier Alive, and the Sustainable uh, Montpelier Coalition. Um, as we all can imagine, there's not 100% support. There's not 100% support from the downtown businesses, our own members, or our customers. But what we've done is we've tried to take uh, everybody's feedback and incorporate it into the details of our proposal. Um, what we're actually proposing is a one-year trial so that this gives us clarity for the year. Uh, we're in one place, but it gives all parties involved an opportunity to reassess and make sure it still really is the right kind of fit. We will be obviously making adjustments as we go along um, to address any issues that come up. Um, we're asking the city to provide a to provide a porta potty for us during the duration of the markets. Um, that was one clear feedback that we got from our customers that there really were no facilities other than having to walk all the way to City Hall and or unfortunately um, we tended to overwhelm the downtown businesses facilities which we heard from as well. One idea that we have to put on the table is to work with Montpelier Alive and create like a quintessential um, Vermont outhouse experience and put the porta potty inside <laughs> attached to the info booth that Montpelier Alive has. And we could lock that and leave it during the week because it, um, it is a financial investment to have to move those things in and out every week. Um, we propose to maintain the lease that we currently have with this facility for the lot that we have. It's adjacent and it just it keeps our contractual relationship there. Um, we are requesting that no non-farmers market members be allowed to vend during the market hours. Uh, our members pay a fee for Ashton's wonderful management services and advertising and things like that. And secondly, that we do feel with the proposed layout um, that it could affect customer flow, it could um, affect our layouts and things right. like that. And we're already squeezed pretty tight in this, in this layout. Um, Can I ask for some clarification? Absolutely. There? Yeah. So when you ask um, for folks not to be able to vend, do you um, mean, for example, uh, restaurants along the street having their outdoor seating? Or are you talking about folks particularly having, you know, who might have a, a food cart or something? Um, yeah, it would be not the downtown businesses. We actually look at this as an opportunity for them to participate and just create a much bigger destination. And, and um, so it would be specifically there are certain vendors apparently that get a permit to vend on State Street. Yeah, the, the street vendors that set up the temporary stands on the weekend or during the week and the food carts. Do we have a sense of how many folks would be affected by that? Just a couple. There were two or three, depending on the weekend, setting up during our trial run. Uh, I don't know who has permits currently for vending on the street. And are you talking, could those vendors still vend outside the boundaries of the farmer's market, say, on Main Street? Yeah, I, I think we think that's fair. It's just kind of right. Not in there. your market, but We've, nearby would be That's how we work fine. right now. They're kind of adjacent to the market. Um, but we did find that it made uh, working with their space 
it sort of interfered with our layouts, honestly. So you've got an exclusivity just within those boundaries from state to down? Yes, uh, correct. Right. Um, Maine to? Maine down, um, correct. Yeah. Um, so um, we're asking also for some help in finding a spot that we can put picnic tables and have a place where people can sit and eat, be a little bit leisurely, <laughs> and a place to store our trailer and picnic tables. Um, with the construction that's going to happen, we think that there's going to be an issue where we, we currently keep our stuff. Um, we have ideas potentially at the courthouse and things like that that might want some city council help to, to forge those, those uh, potentials. Um, we are proposing a different layout than we use. We're proposing a circular layout um, so that the center of the road is going to be open and free. We think that's a better access for emergency vehicles. It's better access for our vendors. And we think it's going to provide better flow for our customers as well. Um, There's a view of that layout on the back of the handout. Yeah. Oh, if you want to There's way more detail out. on the handout, but this is the important part. Um, and we're going to be assigning spaces to, to ensure that we don't put like-for-like like businesses together so that we can be respectful of the downtown businesses as well. Um, the duration we're asking for is 6 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, for the street to be shut down and you know looking forward past this year we hope that we can continue to get some help in trying to find a good um, suitable permanent home maybe even down the road a little bit between Taylor and, and in front of the state house um, but let's work on this first step see how it goes and um, and we'll go for there so that is our proposal we really appreciate your time so normally when we have a street closure, we do the street closure permit application and we hear from um, the various affected city departments. Do we have some opinions from them on this? I think, I believe they've all met, but I'll, I I mean, if they've already signed off on it, then that's. I think, I think so. did pull our department heads to find out if anybody had any objections to this and generally across the board there was broad support for this um, Tom uh, the Department of Public Works has some concern as they always do when we close State Street they're not crazy about closing a throughway that was the one objection we got the police were fine the fire departments fine um, you're here too and they're here too if you want to hear from them um, Sue, do, um, do you know why Tom objects to closing the thoroughfare specifically? Well, he's always worried because we do get state funds and federal funds for for our big roads, okay. for our state so roads. It's more of a roads are for roads. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Right, go ahead. Donna, and then a uh, uh, very minor, just logistical question, though. But in terms of the barricades and the cone packages, just want to. Clear. What, what is the expectation? Uh, Public Works, Montpelier PD, uh, staff. How, how is that one detail going to work? That's a good question. We, I, I know during the trial runs, we were under the impression that we really weren't allowed to handle that stuff. I was saying because it's just going to be a challenge since we're institutionalizing something every week, and I can't always guarantee, especially if there's two officers on, um, that that that's going to happen. So I just want to have that part. I'm not saying, you know, that's a deal breaker. I just want to make sure that we're all clear-eyed to some of those elements that um, the city, when we do close, the city has supported that function, both public works and the police department, usually the police department. Um, you know, we don't have, we don't call them public works generally uh, on a one-time deal um, unless it's a big event or something. So I just want to put that out there. For Can I just speak for a minute? Uh, as we did with the pilot project this past year, the farmers market has agreed to sit down with all the department heads that want to be there at the city and we bring out a big map we go over every detail and go over it and work out the details until everybody's comfortable Great. and we're going to do that again Great. Rosie, you? well i guess i just i want to make sure that we know that that's happened before i mean i assume it it sounds like it'll be fine but i'm not clear what we're approving tonight if that hasn't well, we could make it conditional upon that happening. Their approval conditioning and conditional upon that happening. And so if it doesn't, then. That we have. 
willing to do it. But I thought um, you said I they've seen this. No? I'm sorry, they haven't seen this packet? They haven't seen the, de the details, uh, but we bounced the idea off of them. And the reason that they're here before you tonight and not waiting a little bit is that they also have to start their planning and they have some board meetings coming up. And they didn't want to go through a lot of hoops if, in fact, the council was disinclined to, to allow them to do this. So I have a question about uh, whether you've considered, and I'm sure you have, using the Heaney lot and State Street. It seems like there's enough demand to support both spaces. That's a good question. Um, we try to stay in the smallest area possible. Um, if we move to State Street, then we take up the parking that's on State Street. And so to have adjacent parking is definitely one of the important things that we've heard as feedback from our customers, as well as the downtown businesses. If we take the State Street parking, then it can. And the Haney parking, then there's really not a lot of parking for the direct downtown. I've never, businesses. honestly, though, never had trouble finding parking. I mean, people might have to walk, you know. 100 yards anyway I just as you think about it I think there's demand and I think it would make even a more vibrant atmosphere downtown I think people would really like it and I just question whether I mean I think parking we're always strong happy feedback with more from the businesses yeah. Yeah. not wanting the parking taken well yeah. you know they're you know they lose it in the parking lot now but yeah. they have the on street it's important to the businesses I hear in my district mm -hmm. for sure Yes. Overall, I would just like to express strong support for getting more people out in the streets downtown. Um, you've got some data to back up the sales figures and the results on that. I also would encourage merchants to keep an open mind that this is a win-win, not a competitive situation, and that the more customers we can get downtown and enjoying themselves in our streets, likely they're also going to see those re sales figures reflected in their gross sales as well. Um, I do have a couple points just to go through. Don't need to respond to them, just thoughts. Wanted to um, put out as you're kind of sounds like on the path to developing a solution that's going to work for everybody. Um, making sure that you're planning to work with merchants, and it sounds like you are with restrooms and not competing, putting a competing product directly in front of their business, I think would go a long way. Um, I did get some feedback during the trial run um, from some elderly folks in town about accessibility for disabilities. So while it is an active and public streetscape, any uh, reasonable accommodation that can be made to make those stands as accessible as they were previously, I'm sure would be greatly appreciated. Um, we clarified the vendors on State Street. Do you have a sense of how many parking spaces would be given over to vending between six and two? Uh, I don't have a direct number available, but there is a net gain with the parking that we would gain in the Haney lot, uh, the current market lot, uh, just because of the way the parking's oriented. Sure. Part of the concern is probably going to be proximity to the businesses that are right there on State Street. Um, so as you're managing that parking asset, maybe some dedicated parking for um, those businesses or encouraging your vendors not to consume the stuff that's closer to those businesses or a variety of ways that you might really uh, make accommodation for those businesses so they don't feel sore about losing those spaces directly in front of their businesses. But we can't we can't allow cars in there at all. There can't, there yeah. can't be dedicated parking. When the street's closed, that's In the Heaney point. lot? Oh, no. The Heaney lot is going to be just open. I, don't, I think that's, okay. they're that's not going to control the uni lot. Correct. You have the lease for that lot during that time. But the right. lease is going to be transferred to State Street. Right. I would just uh, I would ask you to think this is a longer term consideration, but not to let parking drive all this discussion. This sort of reminds me of Yogi Berra comment about the popular restaurant. People don't go there anymore because it's too crowded. And I think that's what we, that's a situation we'd face if you expand the farmer's market. Uh, I mean, I th you can think of, I know, one, well, a couple of cities that close their entire downtowns. I think in Des Moines, Iowa, is their entire downtown closes an enormously successful farmer's market. And there's not any parking in downtown, but it's packed with people, thousands and thousands of people every weekend. I mean, that's the whole idea of it. So I think the notion that people aren't going to come because there's not going to be parking would be, I think the result would be just the opposite. I think we'd have more people downtown because it would be more going on. I agree that there'll be more people there. I was trying to make the point that there may be some merchants who have concerns about that Thank shift you. in parking usage. And so the more you can be proactive and accommodate those concerns, it probably would help in the relationships and the ongoing support from downtown merchants. But lastly, I did have one logistical point, and I don't know if, obviously, uh, it was around the 
a traffic signal at state and Maine, and if there is some limited capacity for police support, I'm sure DPW will be looking at whatever signage or traffic control things we can do to help keep people from backing up and trying to turn, and now the police have to get involved, so just that we're thinking proactively about what we can do there. Done. Well, I appreciate you thinking about the parking, because I did hear a lot from merchants. And likewise, I heard they, they really don't like this format. They like the one that you used in your trial, which is the vendors, the farm remarker vendors being inside so that the back of your farmer's market isn't in front of the store. Because this way, people were circulating between the stores, the sidewalks, and, and then they had a walk space, and then your vendors. And it was like a, a pod in the middle. Is there a reason you went and put yourself back against the sidewalks? And so, uh, there were probably there were a couple different reasons that we were looking at that. Uh, one was just better emergency vehicle access, having a wider lane down the center, which also meant for a quicker setup and breakdown because we could have two vehicles uh, go down the center and have vendors set up on either side instead of having only a single lane of traffic, which was an issue. And then one of the major complaints that we got from customers was uh, access for uh, people with disabilities. It seemed that trying to have the vendors in the center and have people kind of walk between the curb and the uh, remaining area of the street next to the vendor was an issue for a lot of customers. Okay, I think you'll find a different response from the merchants downtown. That's mm -hmm. all. Yeah, we we did um, bring this layout to the to the merchants association this past meeting um, because we didn't want them to not realize that we were. Changing. I know how many don't go there, so I think you'll hear. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it's a fair point. It, yeah, it's just been, stay a little more flexible. Bob, did you? Yeah, we would encourage this? this setup. Yeah. With the, the straight emergency vehicle down the fir the first week, and I think it was the second week. There was a couple jogs, so you had to because of the. The build outs in the sidewalk, it caused so emergency vehicles would have had to come down and make a couple sharp turns and it would have been very difficult. This this is what we would encourage and, and would ask for is this set up. Thank you, Bob. All right. Uh, anybody else? Good motion? Um so I um unless there's people from the public who want to comment on this. Uh, so I uh, got an email from uh Sindra um Connison who um, I was cooking with pet, and she wanted. She is not able to be here, so she wanted me to read um, a statement from her. Um, so she says, uh, first I want to apologize for not delivering this short message in person. I've recently been under the weather. Uh, as a downtown merchant who owns the town's pet shop on States, uh, my shop stands 100% behind the farmer's market, sharing our street with us on Saturdays this coming summer and beyond. The other downtown business owners I know strongly support the move as well. I'm speaking on their behalf. Uh, the proposed move brings this, the market far greater visibility, which should translate into far greater vitality on Saturdays in Montpelier, the downtown's most important com commerce day. Uh, more, uh, more people downtown is, a good, is good for the farmer's market, good for those of us with businesses on Maine as well as state, uh, and good for those of us living in Montpelier as my three dogs, my husband and I do. I'm sorry I can't be there as planned to present alongside the farmer's market people who will soon be my new neighbors as well as friends. So that's from Cinder and Chris. Can I just add one yes, more thing? Uh, along with meeting with the uh, city and other departments, uh, I've been going to the Downtown Business Association meetings to discuss some of the potential issues that businesses do have. And while I agree that not, <coughs> excuse me, not every uh, business goes to those, I'm going to be meeting with uh, Sarah, the head of the Downtown Business Association next week uh, ahead of our selection process uh, for the upcoming year just so I can talk some specifics with her and find out if there are any specific businesses that want to meet in person and just talk about any uh, issues from the trial run and what we're looking at doing for this year. Okay, okay thank you. Do have a motion? Anyone? What's the wording here? Um, the motion approving the move of the farmer's market to State Street for the 2018 season. Contingent upon. Or conditioned on the meeting with the. Contingent upon the meeting with all of the heads of departments, affected heads of departments. Is there a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? I guess that, does that, I mean, I'm, I, 
think I know the answer, but this means that we are granting the permits to close down State Street for every Saturday, just just yeah. to make sure that that gets on the record that that yeah. is what is happening. Yep, that's what that's authorized. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you all very much. Look Thank forward to another great season of the farmers market. Okay, our last substantive item tonight is the dog ordinance. Uh, Someone had to be last, right? Uh, yeah, I'm whimpering. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> whimpering like a dog here. All right, so I don't know who's presenting. I, is this from the? I, I don't know who's. Turn it over to Sue. Sue's been kind of shepherding this. And uh, Sue, could you? Bob and Tony. Bob okay. was the chair of the committee. So, Dennis, before we take, well, I don't know who's presenting this I wanna, proposal. I wanted to make a request first. Okay. Um, this is just. Uh, very pleased to have this document. Um, but it's a, like a totally new ordinance, uh, it, not just amendments, and it changed everything. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people. That, I only got this on Sunday, so there are a lot of people who have talked to me about it and said they'd like a chance <laughs> to participate in this um, because it all it, it's, it, uh, it all is so new, and there wasn't uh, there wasn't the ability to. Um, see what you know what from the previous thing although it was the, the previous am uh, amendments the first reading September 27th you know they couldn't see what was added what was deleted and this is really completely new so I would like to propose that we make this we we make this like a, a first reading tonight of this of this new ordinance and have a second reading or have a third reading I was hoping you were going to ask to delay the whole thing at 10 yeah, of 10. Yeah, we go but home. <laughs> All right. We'll delay the whole thing. Delay it. I suggest uh, that. <laughs> well, I, I'm certainly not going to get any argue from me. I'm going to fall over. But uh, I guess, I, guess I, I actually am apt to agree with that. I know that there are a lot of people in our community who care a lot about this. And, you know, they're dog owners, they're non-dog owners, and it's, it's, it's late, which I'm fine going. But I, I also want this to be a super inclusive process because I know that there's been a lot of work that has gone into this, and I don't want to exclude anyone from participating in this. So I'm wondering if we made a commitment to put this, like, as our first substantive agenda item at our next meeting. And that sprinklers? Uh, yeah. And, and I, I think that those two, sh those, those should be one and two, and I'm going to ask selfishly that they be one and two because I'm having major surgery earlier in that week, so I'm hoping to make it, but I probably won't be able to stay for the entire meeting. But I think that yeah. these are two issues that our community is clearly invested in, and I would really like to... Okay, well, if you are you all okay with that? You've sat through this whole meeting, but if you're okay with it, I'd certainly I support that. <laughs> yeah, okay. Any ob okay, is there any objection on the council to uh, no. putting this off for the next meeting? Okay, well, thank you, Dennis, and thank, thank you. you all for your patience, and we'll look and forward... And we'll make an effort to... Look forward to full discussion. Uh, post it. And I yeah, just want to make clear that the commitment is to put those two agenda items as the first substantive. Sure. And it'll be the Thank first you. reading, though. Yes. It'll be the first reading of this version. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's still, it's still it's technically the second, second reading. Second it's reading. amended well, from the first. Yeah, but, but this is entirely different That's from right. the first document. Oh. Whatever. I don't think it matters. <laughs> so will it be a first reading? Thirty. It's tech. It's big time we've done that. I mean, I'm I'm certainly com well have it this assurance that we give this all you know plenty of opportunity for you to if you don't feel like you've had the opportunity to discuss it or to consider it well you can continue that, that, that right. I might suggest you could plan on second reading with a plan to continue second reading right. to a if third if meeting. necessary we could do the, okay. the continuation okay, of the second great. reading great. Thank okay. you. all right thank you all okay so I believe that concludes our regular business tonight uh, the next item would be council reports Donna uh, well, I wanted to go back to an email I sent out, and I think I sent it to the whole council, on the short-term short bicycle parking policy. It's about bike racks that the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure Committee has on their budget that you've approved. We have money for bike racks, and, and sometimes we will have private owners reach out to us, and we may work with them to get a bike rack. Sometimes we have a place that people ask for us to put it on city uh, uh, property, but we did this or this policy. We, we did. We've been doing it, but we didn't have it written down. So we wrote down the policy. We made the application. Anne, who made an application, already 
has us doing some modifications so that makes sure it can be a person can ask for it. it doesn't have to be just a business so if you have any feedback for this or if you feel when we get it finally draft that you have to approve it we'd like to know now otherwise we're going to do some editing get it up use it and keep modifying it until it works right so what's your pleasure so this is city funds this is the this the, the bicycle rack that we have money in the MTAC. I don't think it would be a bad idea for the city to approve it. Okay. <laughs> I really appreciate you've done it, and I think that's great, and I didn't have any problems with it. Didn't know how much micromanaging you wanted to do. I emailed Corey and told him I'm fine with it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are you all set? Is that the majority one is back? Remember them, Rosie? Do you all want to see it? I do not. Okay. Key? You can just email it to me. And I'll look at it. <laughs> I emailed it to you a couple of weeks I ago. I thought you were saying, yeah. you, and I looked at it. I yeah. thought you were saying you'd make more changes. We'd make changes when we get as we get feedback and use it. Oh, okay. This All is right. going to be. No, I did look at it and I thought it was great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Jane. Pass. Um, I want to acknowledge the police department in light of incredibly complicated and difficult situation, um, everything that they've done this week, and um, also the city manager for a really relevant, timely, and thoughtful um, social media post that he made in regards to this incident. I um, also want to acknowledge uh, there have been some refreshments made to our city webpage, um, and greatly appreciate it. It looks like some new photos, and hopefully we're using whatever analytics we're getting back in terms of usage to continue to refine and develop that important tool. Um. So echoing Justin regarding the, the incident this week, and I especially wanted to um, encourage all city staff to take advantage of the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program. Um, you know, even if you weren't directly involved, if you were sitting in your office, if you were driving a truck um, and not there, it doesn't mean that you weren't impacted. Um, and I speak from personal experience that these things can hit you emotionally in weird ways if you don't deal with them. Um, and so I just really want to say there's there's no shame you don't need to feel like you had to be directly involved in order to take advantage of that service that's that's a benefit for you um, like your health insurance like your sick leave your vacation days um, and we expect you to use it um, when you need it and so please please take advantage of that um, likewise I just want to thank uh, the police department um, for their response to the the incident last week and just all the support from the community. Um, I know that all the teachers at the high school are very grateful, um, and uh, and the students as well. So, uh, so yeah, thank you. And um, I, on a slightly lighter note, um, I mean, I know I sort of recused myself from the portion of the uh, um, the discussion about the school bond, but I just want to express that I'm very excited about the the um, infrastructure bond for the school because it involves. Um, fixing the roof, which is currently not functioning in my classroom. Um, and it, is, it has been leaking for the last week. It's very exciting. I have lots of pictures. I would just like to thank everyone who came out tonight to talk about pretty important issues that our city is dealing with. Um, it's really renewed my faith in uh, in our community, and um, I, I'm really, I feel really grateful to serve with folks who are so thoughtful and mindful um, and and to be part of a community who is really invested uh, in everything that, that the city council is taking up. Ashley, you know, it does feel like our community has gone through a lot recently, in particular, of course, the incident at the high school was uh, traumatic, but it also brought out, I think, a lot of uh, positives in our community. There were not you know, support for the police officers, support for the high school and the students, but also the family and even the uh, the young man who was the uh, you know involved uh, in, the, in his family. So I think it really spoke well of our community and in, in rallying behind everybody who's affected and understanding just what a tragedy it was. So um, I appreciate and echo what other people have said about, about the police department, and also of course just a heart goes out to the family. That, and of course, all a lot of us knew knew them, been part of our community for decades so. I just need to note that uh, starting tomorrow uh, I can be accepting 
candidate petitions in the office. The deadline to get those in is the end of the day, February 4th. February 4th is a Sunday. Uh, I don't feel like I have authority under charter to do what we do with state deadlines and make it for the next Monday. So I encourage folks to get that in by uh, Friday, February 2nd, or to use the drop box if it comes in over the weekend, and I will check that. Um, also, just make a note to just folks in general and any candidates that I am doing the online voter guide again. It's at montpeliervoterguide.org, where you can navigate to it uh, through the city website, and it just is going to create a forum to discuss uh, any of the ballot articles on there and for candidates on the ballot to give a little introduction to themselves. I don't have a lot. I also want to express support to the police and the EMTs who had to respond um, and to the school, they were a great ally and the community too. People with very supportive comments. Uh, on a less exciting note, just uh, remind you all that you should have been emailed a, a document uh, relating to my multi-rater assessments. I hope you all fill it out. It doesn't take very long to do it and get that in. That will be helpful. And then uh, in theory, we're discussing our own review of that. I don't know if we want to try to coordinate that. I will not right now, but we're supposed to be doing that on the 14th, too. So, um, so we need to get those forms out and oh, just mention that. That's all okay, is that it? All right. Uh, that's my agenda, but I think that's it. That's it. With that objection at 10 o'clock, we'll be adjourned.